Thanks very much indeed, Aidan. The start of a long and entertaining night here, no doubt, in Birmingham. Kieran Lister and Kosti Nusariov get us underway. Lister with that 4-0 record, Nusariov also unbeaten. And there is a general feeling that they didn't necessarily want to make this match. Two up-and-comers, two guys with a chance in here, Josh. Somebody's O must go, baby. Somebody's O must go. This is the, these make for great fights. Well, let's get to the voice of Bellator. It's a very good evening to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Resorts World Arena as we get set tonight for the prelims at Bellator Birmingham. We'll get the action now underway with three five minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing first the fighter out of the blue corner. At five foot ten, weighing in 154.4 pounds, his professional record, two wins, no defeats by way of Moldova. He fights out of Dublin, Ireland, presenting Konstantin Grusarov. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5 foot 11, weighing in 155.4 pounds. Returning to the Bellator cage, he stands undefeated. Four professional victories, no defeats. Fighting out of Teesside, England, presenting Kieran Lister. And when the bell rings, the referee in charge of the action, Michael Bell. So Kosti Nusariov in those blue gloves up against Kieran Lister. Two fighters that they find pretty hard to match here, Josh, and they have to take on each other. They're both very well-rounded. What I like is that Constantine, what he does really well is he does the great transitions from the wrestling to the leg lock positions. Both just having uh, an early look at each other here. Inside leg kick there from Lister out of that southpaw stance. His second appearance in Bellator made his debut in Newcastle on our show there. In front of that terrific crowd beat Davey McLaughlin with a round one TKO. You can already start to see what they meant when these two are a tough match for each other. Yeah, constantly he's got to be careful on shooting dry. What I, what I mean by shooting dry is he needs to make sure he sets up his combinations or his takedowns with his combinations. Because if you notice right there, he threw a little punch when Lister threw the kick, but the problem was he didn't actually drive through the takedown. He was more concerned about checking or blocking the, the, the strike. Trying to get Lister down against that cage. Closely matched so far in the opening minute here. Real action-packed card, undercard followed by our main events here in Birmingham as the place slowly fills up. Constantine will push the, he'll continue to push the action on the takedown. He'll try to make you tired for defending. There he goes right there. Notice how he set that up with a beautiful head kick first, then drove in on the double leg. That's what I was talking about. Yeah, terrific level change there. Lister doing a good job. I feel like Lister needs to create a couple little angles so he, Constantine just can't shoot directly in and get that takedown just like he did right there. Now Constantine in the dominant position here, but Lister looking comfortable enough at the moment. Pretty well rounded off his back. Sometimes though he gets a little caught up in keeping his legs locked, not attacking or trying to hit sweeps and submissions from that position. The, in, a, in, a, in a five minute round, it seems like a long time, but that's not a really a whole lot of work to do work from your back. Yeah, and while you might get purchase in the fight by good defense, you don't get any credit from the judges for it, so you need to get yourself into a good position. Yeah, you see Lister here kind of holding the head, holding the arm, just trying to keep him down so he doesn't do a lot of damage. But what he needs to do is open his guard, start making some space, because that's what's going to happen right there. Those little chopping shots, even though they don't look like they're too hard, they do hurt and they do add up as the fight goes on. Yeah, that cumulative effect of being in control. This is, losing the, this, is, this is how you lose the fight, though. If you just stay with your guard locked, and you let the guy do the work on top. He needs to be opening his guard and trying to make transitions either to sweeps or submissions from this position. See how he's got the foot on the hip. This is a good way to start looking to attack. Or at least push him back and be able to get back to his feet. Just looking for that leverage at the moment. Lister. Costi just having the better of it so far, though. 
Not a whole lot of action going on. You could potentially, you already heard the refs say, hey, stay busy, gentlemen. That was what I was talking about right there. Nice work on putting the feet on the hips and kicking it back. Lister needs to create a little bit of angle. See how he's just walking straight forward? That's what, opening up the, the straight takedown. He needs to kind of cut, cut angles a little bit, make um, Constantine work for the, the takedown. Needs to try and set up that left hand with that jab as well. Yes. Good right hand from Constantine Isariyaf and the takedown again from him. But that's the other issue right there. When you walk straight in, notice how Constantine was able to land that little loopy right hook. Well, that's what happens when you just stand directly in front of someone and you don't create the angles. Approaching the final minute of this first round. Good job on trying to attack that far Kimura. It's just a hard move to finish, especially with someone in the first round when they're so fresh, they're physically strong. And this is more of a sum power submission to try to hit. You physically have to be stronger than that person to try and break their grip. It's a good thing to attack to maybe create a little bit of movement from the other person to kind of defend. So it makes more space so you can start to get your back your full guard or get a, get a hook sweep in. Try to get back to like a butterfly guard position. Again, just landing some of those chopping punches from that position. Kosti. But I like, I like what he's doing here. He's working his guard up high. Even though his guard's locked, he's working his guard up high. So that takes away the, the ability for Constantine to throw big power punches. Yeah, good work from his back from that defensive position. But he's ending round one on top there. Kosti Nusariev. So round two then between Konstantin Nusariyev in those blue gloves and Kieran Lister in the red and instantly he looks for that level change, that kick followed by the takedown attempt. He's done it again. But that's what he needs to keep doing. Lister, what he needs to do is d either to block and defend, stay just outside the range, expect the takedown to come right away. Also, I'd like to see Lister maybe throw something up the middle, either a push kick, a side kick, or a straight jab right at the chest, which will keep Constantine basically loyal to his position. It'll make him stand, stand that ground. See, beautiful, he rushed in right there, made it easier for Constantine to get in on the double. Beautiful job on trying to hit that duck on Constantine. Lister just needs to stand, just stand up. Sometimes guys try to fight the hands too much instead of just trying to get back to their feet. Now oh. Lister in a dangerous position there nice for a moment, job. trying to escape it, but he's done well. Beautiful job on and switching the position there. What he did is, as soon as uh, Constantine was, didn't have uh, full control on the seatbelt, he was able to spin his hips out, lay his back flat to the mat, and turn back into him. Now he's doing work from top. This is where he, sh he should excel. Because if he gets in trouble in this position where something starts getting threatened, he can just back out. He's trying to drive that knee through right now to try and pass. Trying to pass the guard, which we call the guard is like the legs. So we're trying to pass the legs, trying to get to that side control position where his whole body is cross body on him. So it makes him make him work. What people need to understand is this. The key for the guy on top is to keep his opponent's back flat on the ground. If he can do that, that is key. That, key, that makes sure that he has to turn to his side to always try and do something, whether it's submission, whether it's to get up from the, from the bottom. Sorry, I'm trying to escape, but he's put himself into a vulnerable position here. Nice job by Lister making that transition, letting him roll through and making the transition right to the back. Got right to the seat belt. Now he's got that figure four locked around his waist. That's a tough position because it's actually putting pressure on your low spine as well as putting pressure across your gut, which is taking the wind right out of you. All while you're trying to defend the choke. What it's do you think, Dave? It's a tough position to be in with three minutes of the round to go as well, Josh. Yeah, and, and, I'll, and I can show you after the whole thing tonight, I can show you what this position's like. I just... Yeah. <laughs> it took him how long? Yes. <laughs> Five and a half minutes of a long night. I love it. And already he's at me. Oh, yes, yeah, it's going to be a good night. It's going to be a good night. This is a great fight, honestly. They're, both of them showing high-level skills of grappling. Both of them showing good work on the feet. Yeah, a lot of people were saying to me this week that this uh, would be a fantastic opener. Yes. It would look almost a little bit out of place, and that's been the case so far. Yeah. It's high quality, this, and Lister keeping up that work right here. I'd like to see him try to attack a little bit more, maybe threaten the chokes a little bit more as well. He's doing a good job. Costin doing a good job of defending, but he's doing a good job of kind of keeping the strikes going, keeping tight on the figure four. 
you won't very rarely I mean I'm talking extremely rare will you ever see a ref stand him up from this position I mean, this is considered a finishing position this you have the rear nakeds you got the uh, you got arm bars from this position you got different types of ways to get to the mount position from here as well to, to finish with the, the fight as well so it's very rare that a ref will stand you up from here so I feel like Costantini needs to he needs to put more emphasis on trying to get out of this position Lister as well is potentially trying to use the cumulative effect of those short punches to set up some kind of submission here. But what you have to remember is Lister probably understands that he lost the first round. So he's trying to get that, that next round. So they're one and one going into the third. I think in the last minute of this fight, in the last minute of this round, he's going to really put the pressure on trying to finish this by submission. If he does that and he's able to get close to something, that actually all, also leads to him dominating this round. They've both been working hard here. So what he'll do is he'll try and pull uh, Constantine's head back a little bit and his upper body back as he pops his hip into his low back, into Constantine's low back. That'll stretch him out and kind of sometimes open up the gut and make it hard for you to take a deep breath. As well, it opens up the neck. Because when you open them up like that, generally what happens is they got the person can soak, uh, sink in the choke. Well, in this position, Constantine is just trying to see out the round. Just over 30 seconds to go. Still defending that choke at the moment. But Lister is certainly winning the round. And that will make it surely 1-1. One, one. And maybe more for him here. Good position here, 30 seconds, big elbows. This is what I was telling, gonna try and land some good clean shots, trying to get the finish from here. Kosti fighting against it. And just about hanging on at the end of round two. Really good fight, this. Well, you feel that in any sane world, it has to be 1-1 going into this final round. Both undefeated. Massive five minutes, this, for both of them. This one needs to do whatever he... This one needs to do whatever he possibly can to stop this takedown. Good takedown defense there from Lister to try and get himself into a better position. See exactly what Kostin Usariev is doing here, or is trying anyway. Yeah, he's, he's real forceful on these takedowns. He did a good job of ducking out, but Lister needs to make sure he focuses really hard on getting back up to his feet, not letting him work and establish a good position. He's got that far side arm trap. Able to land some clean shots. Listen, he's doing whatever he can, kind of turn his hips into him, try to work his back up against the fence to work his way up. This is what he didn't want to happen, especially just a minute into the, into the round. He's got to get up. There he goes. He's working his way back up. Oh, just stand up, stand up. But as he tries to get himself up, of course, he leaves himself vulnerable for a moment. Uh, Costi trying to take advantage. Well, he finds himself almost in the same exact position he had Constantine in last round. So now he needs to show the emphasis that he needs to get out of this position. Notice how he's starting to slide his back off a little bit, put his back flat to the mat. He's doing a great job of trying to make the escape. But he's got to fight those hands as well and not let that choke get in there. He's doing a good job right now. He's kind of creating the angle. Constantine, if, if he was smart, he would just try to go to top position because he's almost about ready to lose that position. Yeah, see, there he goes. He's trying to work his way over on top. Really good defense, though, from Lister. Not Who even knows so that if they stay in this position, he's lost the fight, for yes. sure. Not, not even so much defense as much as he's trying to go on top. There he goes. Oh, there he goes. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> he almost had it. He just had that figure four around the body. That sometimes will keep you from spinning fully. And it showed right there. Costin was able to go right to the back from that position. Inside the final three minutes then. Konstantin Lusari off in those blue gloves and Kieran Lister. Both coming into this unbeaten. I'm extremely impressed with both of these guys. Both of them made some good changes after round one and round two. They made, they, they, their corners had talked to them and told them exactly what they needed to do. Konstantin had to push and focus on getting the takedown. Because you could tell he, already, he, he knew he had lost that second round. And the man from SBG, the Moldovan, Konstantin Nusariov is in control at the moment. From the Moldovan Wrestling Academy initially, and 
in times that it's looked like it. So what Lister needs to do here is he needs to put his left knee in under, ah, there he goes right there. Now put, use that to push his, uh, push Constantine's leg away. There he goes. Try to get to his knees. Don't let him get those hooks back in. Start fighting hands and standing up. Constantine doing a good job of using those hooks to kind of uh, push against uh, Lister's back of his leg. See right there, he's got that little hook. But he's up now. He's just got to fight hands and turn and face him. He's getting to desperation stakes and down he goes again. And what that does to the psyche of a fighter as well, when they keep nearly getting up or getting up and back down they go, again, that has a cumulative effect. It's not even just the psyche of it, it just it really does just make you tired. Think about it, you just spent all that energy to get up, and the guy just puts you right back down on the mat, and you're thinking, I gotta fight from this position again. Heading for the final minute. Nothing at the moment that Lister can do to get himself into a dominant position here, which is where he needs to be. Had a nice little attempt there at a hook sweep. Wasn't able to get it, but he's got a nice little butterfly hook right there. He just can't hang out in this position with 40 seconds left. You gotta unlock your guard and start attacking, whether it's submissions, feet on the hips, kicking him back and getting up. Okay, we still in that powerful position, still dominant. But he's on his back now. If he can try to get to that back and try to finish that submission. Oh. Yeah, he's got to scoot out. See how he keeps trying to scoot his hips out from that position. He can get to the back from there. Oh, he put himself into the hook sweep position. He could sense the opportunity, couldn't he? Yeah. He could see it. He just couldn't quite execute. Wasn't allowed to. Final 10 seconds now. That's for the fatigue really sets intriguing in. opening fight. That's where the fatigue sets in in the end of the round. But I gotta tell you, a very hot, hard fought three rounds by both fighters. Very impressive. I was very impressed with the technique, very impressed with how well they handled themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Ben Cartledge, sees the fight 29 28. He scores the fight for Gunasarov. Your second judge at cage side, Doug Crosby, scores the fight 28 27. He sees the fight for Lister. Your third and final judge at cage side, Brian Miner, scores the fight 28 to 28 even. The bout is judged a draw. So here is the tail of the tape, a pro debut for Simon Ridgway. He's two years older than the Italian Solly, who's an inch taller than Ridgway. And the reach is just about the same. The reach is considerable, but how important the reach is going to be today, well, we shall see. Let's get to the voice of Bellator, our MC. It's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for those joining us worldwide on the Bellator MMA Global App, we welcome you to Birmingham, England for the second fight of Bellator MMA's European Series. The prelims now roll on. Our second fight, three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. Introducing the blue corner first. At six foot one, weighing in 170.2 pounds, making his professional debut. He fights out of Liverpool, England, presenting Simon Ridgeway. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner. At six foot two, weighing in 170.4 pounds. He is professional record early on. One and zero oh from Biella Italia. He fights out of Dublin, Ireland. The Monkey King, Nicolo Soli. And the referee in charge of the action, Michael Bell. So Simon Ridgway, there'll be nerves. It's his pro debut in those blue gloves against Nicolo Soli. From uh, near Turin in Italy. Straight away, there's action. Those high kicks there from Ridgway. It's the outside leg kick as well. It's a good high energy start from him. I'd like to see Ridgeway just move his head a little bit offline now that we're settling into a striking um, striking fight. I'd like to see him move his head a little bit offline. 
Solly was uh, a late replacement for this, just uh, got the call last week. Dangerous replacement as well. Bidwe with a nice jab. He got that nice jab, is setting things up. He's got to be careful though, reaching down. You just saw that spinning, spinning back fist by Soli. Powerful outside leg kick from Ridgeway. Already establishing that as a real weapon early on. Leaving his chin a little bit up in the air, Ridgeway is when he's throwing those strikes with the hands. He just lent in a bit. He was a bit over eager, wasn't he? As, uh, Solly applying the pressure onto the cage now and looking for the takedown. Solly doing a good job, pulls him away from the fence, which is a good way to get the takedown in this day and age of MMA. People don't seem to understand that. They still think that the day and age of getting takedowns against the fence is easier. You gotta pull them away sometimes. Well, you could hear that quite clearly. Damn it. Didn't like him grabbing the fence and getting top position as a result of that. That was a message anyway for Simon Ridgway. Yeah, I really wish we could have this conversation with the commissions and talk about the fact that if you grab the fence and you end up on the top position, you should actually put down on the bottom position. Because you could tell Sully was working hard for that takedown, wasn't able to get it because Ridgway grabbed the fence. You should actually have to start at a, as a, at, at a disadvantage yeah. on the bottom. Of those uh, vicious outside leg kicks. But this is what I'm talking about. See, the fight could have potentially been still on the ground right now, where Ridgeway would be on the bottom, where Soli now is working to get back in to close the distance and potentially get in the takedown. He just took a couple clean shots. Beautiful knee by Ridgeway, though. Really good knee. And he sprawls as Soli looks for that takedown. For someone like Soli, who took the fight on short notice, Works so hard to get the takedown, doesn't get the takedown, and then now is stuck on the bottom of someone who's been training for this fight. It, it starts it starts wearing on you mentally a little bit. Now here he is, pull, he pulls guard. Yeah, if you have felt wronged going into it a little bit, and as an underdog, you can feel even more so. Yep. As the fight starts to develop. It just starts wearing on you mentally as the fight goes on. And you just get into the second round, you get into the third round, you're like, oh, I could have, something could have happened great for me in that first round when I could have got the takedown. There's no difference in fighting than there is in, say, uh, what you guys call football, we call soccer. But there's no difference where things change. They make the transition. Momentum is a huge uh, shift from either direction. You know, also, too, for, for other sports, tennis, you know, golf, you start hitting one a good shot, and it just starts, momentum starts building, your confidence starts building. To happen to him in the first round, something like that, it starts kind of taking away your confidence. Especially knowing you didn't have a full camp. Looking for the elbow there, Ridgeway. Solely doing a good job of opening his guard, trying to set up the attacks. Notice how Ridgeway is keeping him pressed, keeping his back flat to the ground, like we talked about earlier. Don't grab it. Don't grab it. Some referees wouldn't have been crazy about the toes in the cage there, but. Solly allowed to use that to try and get himself into a position. Solely using, solely using his, uh, taking a. Yeah, point deduction here for Ridgeway. Yeah, eventually justice is served then. And that will improve Solly's mood. Yeah, I think it will. It definitely lets him, lets him know that the ref is paying attention to the, the illegal fence grabs. I don't know I've, how many times I've seen refs slap a person's hand away six or seven times and still never take a point. And I'm thinking to myself, that guy on bottom is working really hard to move somebody else's body weight around. I think after, you know, a warning one time and a slap of the hands, okay, let's get on to it. Let's, let's basically just take the point. I like, I like what the ref did here. Great job. The jab from Ridgeway. Beautiful jab. We're going to tell you, after watching a lot of his highlights in his, I hadn't, I hadn't seen him use his jab this much, but those leg kicks are playing dividends as well. Still they no really head. start to affect you as well, don't they? Still no head movement, though, when he throws and he leaves himself straight up and down after he throws his combination. You saw Sully right now land a couple good shots uh, in the exchange. Sully with those arms in a good position to. Effect that takedown. Seconds remaining though in a close round one. Solly nearly in trouble right at the end yes. of it there. And he has to 
find a way back into things. Debatable, of course, how the round was scored anyway, so... We'll uh, find out about that after the three, or indeed, should it finish earlier than that. Ridri needs to stick that jab. Stick that jab and throw that low-level leg kick again. Didn't miss by much, you know, with that right hand, but... Again, good level change there from Solly. Trying to get those hands locked right up underneath the butt so he can actually pull him away from the fence and give a lift. See how he pulls him away from the fence. That day and age of getting guys taking them down and putting them against the fence is over. Now, to do good work, you got to take them out into the center of the cage and do your work there because guys haven't been practicing getting up except for against the fence these days. Again, just trying to wear Ridgeway down with those single punches, Solly, as well as applying the pressure on the body. Solly doing a good job of keeping his back flat, keeping Ridgeway's back flat. Keeping his back flat is the, the first step of making sure he doesn't get up. Ridgeway's going to have to turn to his side, or he's going to have to create some space so he can start putting the feet on the hips and get away. See, there he did. He's back is flat now, so it's a little bit harder for him, but see how he turned to his side. Now he's able to start attacking those leg locks. Solly needs to separate the feet and stand up and try and get his leg back. Oh, he's got to be careful here. Oh, he's got to be really careful. Ridgeway was looking for that leg lock, Sonny. Worst thing to be in is where you, you think you're free, and you... Ooh, that's a dangerous reverse hook position to be in. Sonny's trying to keep him off here. Yeah, he needs a quick... He needs a quick punching and kick, and he needs to start getting out. Trying to clear his knee and getting away. Ridgeway pulling on it here. Sonny was in a dominant position at the start of the round. This now is, he looks vulnerable. This is the most dangerous uh, submission in the game, the reverse heel hook position. It's one of those positions you don't think it's on, you don't think it's on, all of a sudden you tore your knee and your, and your ankle out. Soli needs to sprawl that right leg back and get him flat and lay him flat, put his back flat to the ground again. Nice job of making the transition to the mount. Did really well to get himself out of that, didn't he, Soli? I was impressed by his patience there as well, Josh. Didn't panic. Yeah, he did a great job. Coming from a good camp at SBG, like coming from a camp like that, knowing you have good people around you, I think it makes a difference. Never panic when he was in a bad position. Ridgeway needs to just start pushing on the hips and hip escaping out. What I mean by hip escaping out is getting his hips out from underneath him so he can start trying to get back to his guard. There he goes. Now he needs the hip escape as he does it. There he goes, right there. Putting his foot on the hip, trying to attack that leg lock again. Looking for it again. But so he was aware of what he was trying to. And so he's just sitting out and hanging out here. He needs to use that left leg. That left leg's not being used for anything. Put that left leg behind his butt or something and start pushing and clearing your leg out, trying to get your leg away. I don't really like when guys are trying to strike from this position because you're not in a good position to be doing that. It's one thing when you're standing over them and all your power can go down on them. You can throw punches, but right now he's in a leg lock position. You see his face kind of wincing a little bit. Yeah, he's definitely feeling it. Got 90 seconds just under remaining in this second round. Nicolo Soli. Ridgeway really trying to look for that leg lock, look for that position and that purchase now. He needs to keep trying to scoot his butt away from uh, Ridgeway's butt so then he doesn't have to worry about that leg being clear. He needs to clear his knee out from inside. There's that leg lock position again, keeps open up. Here's that reverse heel hook and this is what scares me right here. Josh is wincing, so I, too is Nicolo Soli. I, I cringe every time I see this submission being put on. It's just a nasty submission. Years and years of training jiu-jitsu I've been in. Beautiful job, though. You can open your eyes again, Josh. Here comes Soli from a dominant position with those fits now. Ridgeway was defending himself, but Soli gets the win. In the end, Ridgeway has nothing more to give. Two wins out of two in his pro career for the Monkey King. And Ridgeway beaten on debut. Good fight again, though, Josh. Whoa. I thought it was a great fight. Great transitions for both of them. And on 
honestly, like Ridgeway had opportunities to capitalize. It seemed like every time he went for the submission and he didn't get it, he hung on to it too long. And Sully was able to get to a better position than him. It was in the mount position. So look, he's trying for that reverse heel hook, and I'm over here cringing the whole time. You're sitting here watching me and laughing. But he gets here, as soon as he doesn't get it, he just almost takes the wind right out of him. He deflates. And when he deflates, that's when Sully just advances his position right to the top. He's trying just, to defend himself, but he's offering nothing back. And in the end, the referee had seen enough. Yeah, I mean, they weren't extremely hard shots. You can tell right here, you're watching the replay. They weren't landing clean. But Ridgeway was doing nothing really to defend himself. He wasn't even trying to escape the position. So I, you got to agree with the rep in that position. You can just tell he's, he's sitting down now in the, in the center of the cage. You can tell he's extremely tired. That's what happens when you try to go for a submission so long, use so much strength and so much pressure on yourself to get it. When you don't get it, that's what happens. And as we must always say, we're here cage side, of course, but the referee is always in the best position, can look into the eyes, can just sense it. And he got that right, I think. You, you got to feel good coming in, taking the fight on short notice and getting the win, leaving with the W. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get the official announcement now from Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially. Four minutes, 32 seconds, round number two. Referee Michael Bell steps in, waves off the contest due to strikes for the winner by TKO, still undefeated, the Monkey King, Nicolò Sully. So here is the tail of the tape then. A pro debut for Rafael Uchegbu. One and one for Percival, who's six years his senior and two inches shorter as well. The reach advantage too for the man from Liverpool. Let's get to the voice of Bellator himself. It's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight here at Bellator Birmingham, we go now to the Bantamweight division. Set for three five minute rounds. We introduce first the blue corner. At five foot eight, weighing in 135.4 pounds. His professional record early on stands at one and one. He fights out of Workington, England, presenting Lee, the Punisher Percival. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot ten, weighing in 134.8 pounds tonight, making his professional debut. He fights out of Liverpool, England, Rafael Yachimbu. And the referee in charge of the action, Michael Bell. So Rafael Yachimbu in those red gloves and Lee Percival in the blue gloves. Certainly the outsider here, the man from Workington. I was talking to uh, someone who knows more about body language than me, who said he felt that after showing a great deal of confidence at Chegbu, he's looked a little bit nervous in the last couple of days ahead of his debut. Of course, you've got to cope with that, but might not all be plain sailing as many had felt. Well, Chegbu's. Bread and butter is the ground, so he's going to try to get this fight as, to the ground as fast as he can. He's just so dynamic on the ground. He'll, he'll throw the legs up real quick and easy on triangles, arm bars. He'll hit all sorts of different types of guillotines and positions, but this is where his weakness is on the feet. So you can look for him to try to get this fight to the ground as fast as he can. Good right hand there for Percival, who of course wasn't interested in going to ground with a check boot. Bounced back pretty quickly there. Nice way to start, though, with a... Stinging shot over the top like that. But I've had this conversation with you, Ollie, a couple times earlier today, is that he's just walking straight in. That's a, that's a little bit hard to get those takedowns when you just start to walk straight in. You've got to create a little bit of angles with your striking and set up your takedowns that way. The one thing about Achebu, what he will do, though, is he will jump position. So he will jump. Notice how he, tried to, he basically got taken down there. But he will jump to triangles. There he goes. He's working those legs up high. He will jump a flying triangle. He will try for a flying armbar. He's very, very dynamic on his on his feet when it comes to his submission attacks. There's certainly a dynamism about it that makes him exciting. Looking for that triangle. Rafael Echegbu. 
This is exactly where Percival didn't want to be. And he's here inside the opening two minutes after that little bit of early success. Yeah, what you find with guys uh, for stand-up guys, right? We're excited with the spinning back kicks, the spinning heel kicks and things like that. But when it comes to jiu-jitsu, this is what excites us right here. The way he's setting this up, very nicely done. Trapped that arm, worked his legs up high. Now he's got to push that far side arm across his body to finish this triangle. It's already on pretty tight. That, that left arm of Percival needs to go across his body. There he goes. Had enough. The Czech boo lives up to the height. A win on his pro debut with that well-executed, well-thought-out triangle. And Rafael Echegbu, we knew already, was going to be a name to watch, and that is a good start, Josh. It's a beautiful job here. So he trapped that arm with the overhook, able to get his left leg up over the shoulder and the neck, and he locked it in. And now what he's trying to do is he hooks the leg so he can't pull out. The arm's not fully across, but when you have long legs like that, you don't really need that arm to be across. You can tell it was getting tight fast. There's the tap. No option for Lee Percival. It's great, great to hear you with that sense of uh, joy in the skill level there and that sense of hype about it too. Let's get to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. Two minutes, 14 seconds, round number one tap by way of a triangle choke, he begins as an undefeated professional by submission. Rafael Yuchebu. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape then as we recover from uh, that from Josh. Akon Waddle is two years older than Sam Slater, considerably taller as well. And look at that reach advantage, Josh, quickly. Yeah, you're going to see right now with Akon Wallace, you're going to see him use that reach and that range to set up his punches and kicks. And I'm telling you right now, he's very dynamic on the feet. OK, well, I can feel the presence of the voice of Bellator, Michael C. Williams. From Bellator, Birmingham, we now go to the lightweight division set for three five-minute rounds. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 155.4 pounds. His professional record, two wins, one loss by way of County Clare. He fights out of Dublin, Ireland, presenting Sam Slater. And across the cage, his adversary tonight, fighting out of the red corner at six foot one, weighing in 154.8 pounds as a professional. He too stands at two and one. Originally from Montego Bay, Jamaica, he fights out of Birmingham, England, the Jedi, Akon Wanless. In charge of the action, your referee, Brian Miner. So Brian Miner, the man in charge, Sam Slater with those blue gloves and Akon Wanless with the red gloves. Huge height advantage, reach advantage in favor of Wanless who trains at Team Renegade locally, but was at SPG and that's why he and Slater know each other well. And why it's been described as that respect match between them. High energy start, certainly, from both of them. This is what happens when sometimes you guys have crossed paths before. You've seen each other fight quite a bit. The comfort zone's already been set in place. So there's really no feeling out process. That's why I always feel it's best to fight people that you kind of know or you kind of have seen a fight a lot because that brings out the best in both of you. They had a little exchange of words at the, at the weigh-ins yesterday. So there was a little bit of that, like, that, that posturing from both sides. Again, that happens so often, doesn't it, when Two fighters know each other well and know about strengths and weaknesses, I guess. Good right hand there from Wanlis. And the outside leg kick. Measured start this from the taller man. Slater did well just in time to block that kick. This has started, not one to take your eyes off here. 
Plenty of action, just 80 seconds in. Slater has that busy style, that very, like, moving around a lot. The only problem is, is when he throws, he leaves himself kind of out of position sometimes. And that has to do with the reach and the range. He's having a hard time getting in and landing the combinations. Goes right to the takedown. I think this is a good idea. That will help open up his striking as well, even if he doesn't get this takedown. It makes Wanless think about the takedown on the shot. He's a very good grappler, Sam Slater. Oh, nice shot. But he's getting himself into trouble there. It was another good right hand. Those rangy right hands. He's found the range well so far here, Juan Liz. Just switches momentarily there. Comfortable in both stances. I got to tell you, Matt, Slater looks like a guy who's been in there 10, 15 fights. He's relaxed, composed, calm. I mean, even though he's losing the exchanges right now because of the range and the distance, he's fighting a very good fight. I think as the fight goes on, we're going to see exactly if that's going to play dividends for him as well because he's a busy fighter. That was a really sharp inside leg kick there from Slate. He could see the pain that caused. There's a nice uppercut, though, on the inside there from Wanlis. Nice little cut break on the, uh, or nice little elbow on the break there. By Slater. Ooh, nice shot. Good Ooh. left jab, isn't it, from Wanless? He should set everything up behind that. Slater was just trying to keep him off there. What I like by Wanless there is he landed a good couple good clean shots, but didn't rush it. Then he tried to go for the flying knee, didn't get it. But regardless, though, sometimes when guys land good shots, they rush in, they smother themselves. So it's that range, isn't it? Oh, it is. It's Ability to take that half step back to see where your long arms can do the most damage. He's done that pretty well so far. He's only thrown that jab. He's only landed it once anyway. That looks a really useful punch. There's that right hand again. Wallace doing a good job keeping that range. He feels really comfortable. When they're on their feet here, Wanless, another terrific left jab followed by the uppercut. A nice, nice body kick there. I'd like to see Slater threaten that takedown a little bit more. That'll help open up the hands and the combinations to the feet. Ooh, nice see jab. that left jab again, Josh. And it, do it, doesn't, it doesn't even have to really have a lot on it. It's just the range that he can throw it at. And that's the benefit of four ounce gloves, isn't it? With a, a nice, easy, long left jab like that, it can cause a bit of damage. Yeah, because unless you parry it and slip it, there's really, they get through. It's not like boxing where the bigger the gloves are a little bit bigger, and I can parry it or block it with the bigger gloves. You can't do that. There's that jab again. That jab yeah, again. is setting everything up. He's been intelligent enough here to work out how well that's working for him as well. One less doubled it up there for a moment. Locks the kick there of Slater. He's trying to think his way out of this problem at the moment, I think. It's hard to knee guys when, when you're, that, you're that much shorter than them. You know, trying to get the knees to the body, trying to get knees to the thighs. Slater doing a good job, though. I, mean, I gotta tell you, I'm, very, I'm actually very impressed with his mobility, his acti how, how active he is on the feet. Nice work. Well, Sam Slater has got a science degree from Trinity College in Dublin. I mentioned he was trying to think his way out of that little bit of trouble. And that brain of his will be working overtime here as we head into round two. Hey, he just hasn't been able to find that range yet that he can get in and get out. He's He's trying to throw the feints, it's just not working right now. It's getting on that inside, and when he gets inside, he's not really threatening the takedown. He's trying to stay in that clinch position, which is not going to do him any favors. Here we go. Look at that, the uppercuts there from Wanless as he followed up. This is not where he wants to be with Wanless because of the clinch in the knees. Those knees can get up to Slater's head at any time. So he's, yeah, this is where I'd like to see him at. Dropping down on the leg, threatening the takedown, that takes away the offense of Wanless. Just allows him as well, Slater, a bit more thinking time too. Gets him into a, a safe position. Nice job by Wallace to turn him off the fence. 
turn himself off the fence, avoid the takedown against the fence. Ooh. That looked like it was a little low. Absolutely. That wasn't, though. Again, one list blocking those pretty effortlessly, seeing them coming. Where it becomes problematic for Slater is when they're boxing. That reach of Wanlis at the moment is winning in the fight, and his accuracy too. Slater has that look on that. He has that look that he's somebody that if you met him in a local pub, that you would just think, oh, I got this guy, no problem. And look at him moving around, taking some shots, but giving his shots. I mean, like he's that guy. You, you were talking about he, he, has a, he has a degree, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, he looks like someone that would have a degree. They're not a fighter, though. <laughs> but no, he, he, he's fighting a great fight. He's just having a hard time figuring out that range. Quite revealing, that, isn't it? If you ever meet Josh Thompson, you know that he's measuring you up. <laughs> One of the, that was a nice little trick there. I would have liked to have seen him try to do that some more. He tried to hip into him a little bit, throw him off balance, and then ankle pick the far side ankle. Just the range is too hard. It's too hard to reach down that low and still keep control of the hips with the underhook. But he did a good job of bumping him and setting it up. I like that little body kick. Yeah, it's getting the through every good, once in a while. It? It's getting through every once in a while there. And now what you do is you set that up. You throw that body shot, you throw that, bo that body kick, and then you faint that and throw go, to, go, up, go up top to the head. I've had a little success with that against someone named Nate Diaz. I don't know if you guys know that, but yeah. <laughs> it's just one of those things. You got to try to set those moments up. I'm not sure you mentioned that, but perhaps we'll return to it. Yeah, I, I normally don't mention it, but I'm simply saying like I was a smaller, shorter guy against someone like Nate, which is what Slater's going through here right now. So if he can actually faint throwing jabs to the body or throwing uh, straight rights to the body, something along those lines, throw body kicks there. I guess him to dip to that side a little bit so that opens up the head sometimes. See, this is not where he wants to be. He does not want to be in the clinch with, with Wanless at all. Yeah, he was trying to return fire there, wasn't he? But again, Wanless. He's gone away a little bit from that jab. It's been better work in this second round from Slater. Oh, big shot, shot though. Again. Brian Miner just had a look there momentarily. It's a big shot, though. Yeah, Slater taking some big shots. The nose, and there's a right hook as one list follows up. Referee is all over this. He's caught him again, and this time he calls it off. Too much. From Akon Wanless, too relentless and too good. A little bit early of a stoppage. I would like to see it go a little bit more because you saw uh, Slater back out of there and thinking to himself, he to raise his hands up to the ref like, hey, ah, uh, come on, let me fight out of this. Well, here's the finish. That was a great shot, wasn't it? Beautiful jab with a little upper right hook, nice uh, uppercut, I mean, just nice work done by Wanless. And even that push kick has no range on it. There's no way of him using that to utilize to keep the distance at him. Some big shots, though, against the fence there. Wallace able to land some good combinations. Yeah, nice moment in the ring at the moment. Wallace was raising Slater's hand. There he is celebrating. Good display from him. He moves on, so too does Sam Slater. Let's hear now from Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end of three minutes. 55 seconds round number two, the winner by TKO the Jedi, Akon Wanless. Here's the tail of the tape, or indeed of the table. Dan Cassell, 3-3 three, three and 1, 4-2 and two, John Nichols. Look at the age difference as well, nine years. And the reach advantage, again, is in Nichols' favor. Let's get to the voice of Bellator. It is, of course, Michael C. Williams. Tonight from Resorts World Arena, Bellator Birmingham now goes to the lightweight division three. Five-minute rounds 
and we introduce the blue corner first. At 5'11", weighing in 157.6 pounds, his professional record, four wins, two losses. He fights out of London, England, presenting John No Mercy Nichols. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5'10", weighing in 154.8 pounds. As a professional, he's 3-3-1. Three, three and one. He fights out of Wolverhampton, England, Dan Porchop Cassell. In charge of the action, your referee, Brian Miner. So John No Mercy Nichols here in the blue gloves, Dan Cassell in the red. Little touch of gloves before we get underway. And well, Cassell went for a dramatic start and lost his balance. Akon Wanless was saying it's a little bit slippy in there, and I think Cassell just found that out. Yeah, a little trick of the trade when it's when the canvas is going to be slippery. What I do is the, my my sandals that I would wear out, my flip flops or my slippers that I would wear out, I'd put some water on the bottom of them. So when I, my feet came out, they were still a little damp on the bottom. Keeps you from slipping around on the canvas. More on that in a moment, but take down a tent from Cassell and then a good response there from Nichols. Right into that guillotine. He's got that arm and guillotine. He's got to shift his hips a little bit to the side so he can start working on that choke. It's hard to finish it when your back is just flat there. It's that, not that it can't be done, it's just a lot harder to finish it from there. Good explosive start. Really good uh, cage awareness there by Nichols as well. You can use this position not so much to finish, but also to try and sweep and get to the top position. You're threatening that choke, threatening that, that, uh, that arm and guillotine. You can use that position to either hook sweep and send him over so you can get to the top and do some work from there. There he goes. He should have scooted his hip out there to try to uh, work on the getting the sweep. Cassell working his way up. If he's able to work his way past the legs, he can get to the mount position and it kind of nullifies that guillotine. Yeah, just letting those punches go to the body, trying to get himself into some kind of position here. Said that he's got more experience, he's the more rounded fighter, but Nichols in the better position at the moment in this round one. That's get, that was getting a little tight there for a second, now he's yeah, in that was. guard. You can always tell when the guy starts moving a little bit more in that guard, he's, you know that they're defending something. They're trying to relieve the pressure somehow. Done well, Cassell. Cassell doing a good job of keeping his head up and his posture up, so it's going to be hard for uh, Nichols to get to land the clean shots. Just those single nice. shots there from Cassell. He's got to be careful getting swept from this position. Looks like he was trying to trap that arm, but you can still be swept when you put your knee over that arm like that. Even though those don't look like they're landing too clean, what it does is it forces the movement. So Cassell, Cassell forcing the movement of Nichols. Nichols looking to get to the back. Those elbows were landing clean, all right. The other thing what you, don't, you need to remember is that those elbows, they don't need to land super clean. They just need to catch you just a tiny bit before there's a cut. And then that looks, start, doctors start looking at that. It also starts taking the energy out of you. Speed Good elbow. to Cassell, and he gets the win. He gets the win in round one. Dan Cassell on his Bellator debut. And in the end, Brian Miner had seen enough, Josh. So what you're seeing here is he's giving him little chopping shots. So then uh, Nichols has to let go of holding the, holding the body down. So when he does that, that makes the space for him to start landing the elbows. Even though they're not, they're not, they don't look super hard shots there. But he's able to land some clean ones, and it was just the accumulation and him not moving to look to defend himself. The ref had seen enough. I think it was an early stoppage, but the fact of the matter is that he wasn't moving to defend himself or at least try to escape the position, and the ref has seen enough of that. Ladies and gentlemen, the official time, three minutes, nine seconds, round number one. The winner by TKO Dan Porchop Cassell.
here's the tail of the tape. Craig Turner, six years older than Ashley Reese, taller as well. And that reach advantage once again in Turner's favour. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight here at the Bellator MMA European Series, we present now three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot ten, weighing in 168.4 pounds. His professional record near perfect with seven victories, just one loss. Fighting out of Stokon Trent, England, presenting Ashley the Beast Reese. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 169.8 pounds as a professional. He enters tonight undefeated, seven victories, no defeats, fighting out of Leicester, England, Craig, the Defer Turner. And the referee in charge of the action, Brian Miner. So Ashley Reese, born in Newham in East London, now training in Stoke-on-Trent in those blue gloves and Craig Turner, who certainly has the support in this arena. Yeah, hands down he does. You can hear him when he started walking out and the song started playing, his, the crowd went crazy. He's looking to utilize a couple of those outside leg kicks early on, Turner. Turner's not the easiest guy to take down. I've seen him a couple of his fights before. He's just, he's good and gritty at just making it a dirty, grimy fight. And those are the kind of guys that Asher Reese is going to have to be tested against because he's someone that's going to try to impose his will and try to get those takedowns. If he can't get the takedown, he tends to fade a little bit as the fight goes on. Well, it'll be interesting to see that cardio tested, which he's proud. Well, anytime you have someone who's pushing and forcing the takedown, like we saw earlier with Constantine, it gets tiring if you don't get them. Every time you don't get them, it's a, it's a knock on your mental. It's like you're thinking to yourself, man, if I can't get this takedown, what am I going to do? So as the fight goes on and you're not getting them or you do get them, your confidence either builds or it doesn't, it doesn't build at all. Well, that's what he's looking for at the moment, Ashley Reese. What Turner needs to do is just not focus so much on trying to land strikes while he's against the fence. He needs to try and turn and get off the fence and take the fight back to the center of the cage. This is the one thing that I love about fighting in, in Britain here, is just all of this. All the noise. All, I love it. I absolutely love it. I think the British fans are just the, the, probably the best in the world. This is amazing. Absolutely. I'm glad you said it. You'll always get that passion and that energy here. All right. But I bet you if we were surrounded by Irish people, they'd say they were the best. <laughs> they had the best fans. <laughs> Not getting into that argument, that's for sure. <laughs> Reese again with Turner pressed up against the side of the cage. Turner doing a good job of hand fighting. He just needs to try to circle off as he's trying to hand fight so he doesn't keep his back to the fence. Got a good wide base. Doing a nice job, not letting uh, Reese lock his hands. Notice how Turner's arm is right at the crook of the elbow there. That's a great job of making sure that you can't lock your hands or lock, you know, lock your hands around the legs or the waist. Little cup check there. Doesn't look like it was too bad. Saw so Turner just kind of give the look like, yeah, a little low, buddy. Well, he's got time to recover here. A little word there for Ashley Reese from uh, Brian Miner. I think he was also telling him to wash the head. Yeah. What it looked like. Turner got a good left hook, so I want to see if he's setting that thing up a little bit as you go on. Nice little low level leg kicks too. Those little calf kicks as we saw with Tricky Pitbull and Ryan Stroke. They play big dividends as the fight goes on. Absolutely, they slow up your opponent, don't they? Reese now has that right leg here at Turner. Turner doing a great job at defending that, that, uh, that far side arm. So he can't lock his hands or grab the ankle. It's already very technical up against that cage. Both fighting for control with the hands. Little pot shots as well as we saw there from Turner. 
the pot shots, all they do is they kind of make you move your head a little bit. You don't want to get hit, so you move, and when you move, you create a little bit of space. Sometimes that, oh, that space is enough for you to actually get an underhook or, you know, circle your hips out from away from the fence. Great character, Craig Turner. Little knee there from him. He describes himself as a lovable rogue. And says he gives his ticket commission to charity. I must say, I checked that with somebody. <laughs> Cynic that I am and said, Is that really true? And it is. Good guy. Matt from Leicester and well supported here. Reese with the takedown finally. Nice job. He's got he's got to let go of that arm now. Turner does and he's start putting his uh, back to the fence and try to work his way up. It's against the rules for him to have his toes in the fence there. I'm surprised the ref hasn't said anything yet. Second time we've seen that this yes. evening. He's got to be careful putting those toes in there because the ref will take a point for that. I was watching uh, Primus Chandler too, and that was much picked up upon, wasn't yeah. it, in that fight this week? Ahead of the course of our main event tonight. The Brian Miner not picking up on it. Like I had said, I said a couple times already earlier tonight. Turner's back is on the on the ground, flat. He needs to turn and create an angle from the side. If he can turn and create an angle from the side, he can start mounting some sort of offense. Right now, when his back is flat, there's really no offense to be had here. Reese did a good job making sure that he's just holding in there, not really using a whole lot of energy, making, making Turner use all the energy to try to escape. And the point that we made earlier on tonight as well is that, of course, it wins you the round. In general, that kind of control, that kind of position for Reese. Very true. Good, uh, good sign of sportsmanship there, helping him out. Very nice. Well, finally, we can get round two underway. Ashley the Beast Reese here in the the blue gloves against Craig Turner, the man they call Duffer. In the red gloves, Reese worked hard for that takedown. In that in that first round, when he finally got it, he didn't let it go. But this is where Turner needs to keep his back off the fence. He needs to circle and stay out. So he needs to turn him. Don't, don't settle in against the fence. It's not a, it's not a line of defense anymore. Back in a very similar position straight away. This is where Asher Reese wants to have this fight. He'd like to keep it pressed against the fence. Turner can't land any big shots or any big kicks. Can't really do a whole lot of damage from this position. If Reese can eventually get the takedown, secure that top position, we saw already earlier that Turner had a hard time getting up from the bottom against Reese. One of those straightforward fellas, Craig Turner. You often uh, get fighters with lots of talk in the build-up to these kind of fights, and he was asked about what advantages does he have over his opponent. He said, well, none really. <laughs> what about your prediction? Haven't got one, really. Yeah. Don't like to do that. <laughs> nice down-to-earth fella. Proper fighting man. But up against the cage here, and after he was under pressure for the second half, really, of that first round, he needs to make something happen here, Craig Turner. Remember, it's only three times five. He haven't got long to put things right. Turner doing a good job of throwing those little knees to the body. That Those eventually will play dividends later in the next round. But I like how he circled out here. Nice job. What, that was a, that's a classic example of what not getting over anxious. You saw that in the last fight uh, with Wallace, where he didn't get over anxious when he landed a clean shot. This time Turner landed a couple good shots, stepped in head hunting, and ended up getting taken down. An easy takedown too. So Asher Reese now is just relaxing and resting. Yeah, Reese again in that dominant position, good head position from him as well. You, you can hear you can hear uh, Paul Daly kind of coaching Turner through how to get back up to his feet. What he's doing is he's telling him to keep that wizard. There he goes, puts his back to the fence, and leaning against the fence to help himself get up. Did well, didn't he, Turner, to get up and recover? 
everyone around here having a having a laugh and a giggle because it's just funny when you have other fighters in the arena and they have they know somebody that they're that they love watching fight and he's giving you can hear Paul Dillard talking so much emotion right now. Get up, do this, do that. You know, it's it just comes comes through. Nice job. Took again there from Turner as Reese rather overbalanced and fell in. Turner needs to keep him pressed against this, uh, keep him against this fence here. Start landing some good knees and doing some good work here. Honestly, I think Turner right now is winning the round. Not by much, it's a close round. But he's winning the round slightly because he's landed the more damaging shots. Just about to say that, Josh. He needs a big sort of 80 seconds here. Good to make knee sure that's a great knee from Turner. He needs to stop head hunting though, okay? Go low to the body, maybe a couple little low kicks. There you go. Right on cue, Josh. Outside and an inside leg kick, and then Reese with a straight left hand. And back we are in this position. He can't afford to take a rest now. This is not where you want to rest. You want to try to get out in the open match. If he loses this team down, that's what we were afraid of. He needs to get up by the end of this round. 50 seconds remaining. That was the last thing he wanted to do was settle in on the bottom, but he did. See how he put his back flat? That's not where you want to be. He needs to scoot his hips out on that left side, the side he has the overhook. Scoot his hips out, try to post up on that right hand and get back up to his feet. That half guard position with where he's got the legs locked, he needs to unlock his legs. All that's doing is locking himself down on the bottom. The wider perspective, the question is, would this be enough to cost turn of the round? I honestly believe it's gonna be because he lost two takedowns. Even though he was able to get up off the first one, he landed some good clean shots, but nothing that really wobbled Reese. It, it did land clean, kind of snapped his head back, and it looked good for the judges. But it wasn't enough to, for him to win the round, I don't think, not after losing that last takedown. So we're gonna show right here. Nice little right uppercut setup, but he gets hit with something clean himself. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together as we go now to the third and final round. Third and final round. Ashley the Beast, Reese and Craig Turner. This Reese is in the blue gloves, Turner in the red. That's what Turner's got to do there. He's got to throw those uh, kicks, keep his back off the fence. You see Ashley Reese rushing to get the takedown. He solidifies one takedown. I think he thinks he can win this round. And then if he wins this round, for sure the fight. And we don't want to start playing the second-guessing judges' scorecards game, but that's what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons we're here, Josh. Yes. It's what you're here for. I mean, we've already seen in the Constantine fight that the judges will sometimes, they'll, they'll issue a draw. They'll issue um, some scores that we didn't potentially agree with. So the fact that Turner was able to bounce right back up, that was good. Even though Ashley Reese took the takedown, Turner bounced back right up to his feet. Nice job. I've got to feel like the best it can be for Turner right now is 1-1 one, one in terms of rounds. So he needs this third and final round. Reese seems comfortable in this position and comfortable and confident that he's going to eventually find a way to execute the take there. Go grab the fence! Just had a natural reaction, he reached over and grabbed the fence. I'd like to see him, he slowed his momentum and him getting taken down. I'd like to see him pop back up to his feet though if he can. Post up on his left hand right there and stand back up. Those legs are getting locked up. Oh, he's in that out, out, now. Push it out. The school teacher has the race and he's trying to teach Craig Turner a thing or two, the younger man. Actually that defeat against Adam Proctor was nothing to be Ashamed of for uh, Reese Inger, that was a very good opponent. This would be a good win for him if he can outlast Craig Turner. Turner's got that overhook on the left side. He's the bottom of that overhook and go to the underhook and scoot his hips out on that left side. Trying to get back to his feet. There's no doubt that Turner's a gamer. He's someone who wants to get down and fight, but Ashley Reese came here to win. He didn't come here just to get into a fight. Turner unbeaten, but Matt is under serious threat now. He's got to get out of this position. Two and a half minutes to go.
Turner doing it, or Reese doing a good job of keeping his knees pinched together it's over both the legs. He's kind of like in a half mount. What we like to call it's like a little dope mount position. So he's he's low on the legs and he's kind of he's kind of pinching his knees together. Oh, he lost that position. Now he's back in the half guard. I wouldn't be surprised though if we see the ref stand him up because these little choppy shots that Reese is doing is not doing any damage. He's not even attempting to try and pass. I wouldn't be surprised if we see the fight stand up. Reese is happy here. Elbow cross face, actually. Elbow cross face. Two to go, Ash. That's one. And he is uh, physically very big and strong as well, Ashley Reese. He has that really thick torso. You can just tell, like, when he gets on top, you can, you can tell he has that heavy hip pressure. One minute! He's well nicknamed in terms of that physique and that capability. You hear that crowd, get ready to turn trying to get him to raise back up to his feet. Right now, he isn't finding a way to get himself back to his feet. Reese is too strong, too good, too dominant. Just looking for an opening. Reese's corner wanting to look for a finish here, but I think he's happy enough with the way it's going, but he feels that Turner is tiring. There's really no reason for him to move. The ref's not going to stand him up and make him force more action. He's kind of staying busy with a little choppy shot. If that's good enough for the ref, it's good enough for uh, Reese. Yeah, Brian Miner is happy that it's all active enough. And Reese has surely done enough here as we head. Final 10 seconds here. so he can keep that fight on the feet. Reese doing everything he had to do. He just came out, implemented his game plan, never let the big shots get to him, able to get the takedown one after another, slowly just um, picking him apart. Great job, great performance, great, great show of sportsmanship. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. All three judges, Doug Crosby, Michael Bell, Leon Roberts, all see the fight exactly the same, 30, 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Ashley the Beast Reeves. So here's the tale of the tank. Gavin Big Tasty Hughes, nine and one. Mohamed Yahya, five and one. Height is similar. Reach favors the man from Dubai. Hughes, seven years. Your hair's senior as well. Let's get now to the voice of Bellator. It's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight here at Bellator Birmingham, we go three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 155 pounds even. His professional record, five wins, just one loss. He fights out of Dubai, United Arab Emirates. Please welcome Muhammad Yahya. And across the cage, his adversary tonight fighting out of the red corner at five foot ten, weighing in 154 pounds even as a professional. Near perfect, nine victories, just one defeat. Fighting out of Liverpool, England, introducing Gavin Big Tasty Hughes. In charge of the action, your referee, Brian Miner. So Mohamed Yahya in those blue gloves, the man they call Big Tasty, Gavin Hughes in the red. Already a win tonight here in Birmingham. 
for pork chop can big tasty follow suit here do not take your eyes off this they both like to get the job done early straight away there's intent there from the man from dubai Yahya. who's happy to Soak up those kicks and then look for something of his own. I'd like to see who's Hughes move a little bit more lateral movement versus just bouncing straight in and out. There he goes, moving a bit left and right. There's a bit of spice between these two at the way in as well. And Hughes looking for that. Take down Ali here. I think what these young fighters need to understand is when you get takedowns against the fence, you're lifting them up. Take them back to the center of the, the cage and set them down there. As soon as you set them down against the cage there, they're able to you put their back against the wall and start working their way back up. It just has to do with the younger generation. They're figuring it out, but they haven't quite got it down yet. It's also a lot of energy to lift somebody up and then try and walk them around. He was doing a good job of getting the lift. Got himself into a great position there. Gavin wasted a lot of energy though trying to get these big lifts and these big takedowns. You see how he didn't pull him away enough. He needs to turn him the other direction and take him down. Yeah, hey, we're able to use the cage to get back to his face. But again, that's four solid takedowns. That's a lot of energy. And he keeps getting back up. Stay in, walk around him. Left arm reaches back down. There we go, yeah! Get on his head, yeah! Get on his head, yeah! Get on his head, yeah! Keep working that hook in. Right hook in. Yeah, looks as relaxed as he can be in that position. Stay on him, stay on him. He's calm, composed. Good turn against the fence there. That's something I would have liked to have seen Turner try to use in the last fight. He was able to scramble and keep the tight position. This way, start pushing that knee. Now, start trying to pass that knee. There he goes. Right wing, right step control now. Right step control now. Right step. Right step. Right step. Right step. Right step. Right that's a ton of energy being used trying to get those takedowns, especially when you get three or four of them in a row and the guy just bounces back up. Give me that Hughes is doing more than enough to be in control of the fight so far. Let's not forget that. But that's why his head's just down right now. He's just kind of getting his breath, he's getting his wind about him, trying to slowly pass. Happy in that half guard there, Hughes. Yehaya just waiting for his chance here. He was trying to soak this up and respond. He was doing a good job of keeping his back flat to the ground, like I've talked about repeatedly tonight. Was just keeping, the, making sure if you're the top position, you're a dominant position. You want to try to keep their back flat. They have to turn to their side to create any type of offense, whether it's a sweep, whether it's a submission, they're always at the trap trying to get to one side of the air and create an angle. And Hughes says he likes to come out all guns blazing, and that was his plan on his Bellator debut. Knee to the body there from Hughes. Hughes needs to pull him away from the fence. See, now he's able to start kind of working to using the fence to get back to his feet. Got a minute left in this round. I give the round so far to Hughes, but it's really a toss. If you see, if, if he was able to actually get a takedown on him, on Hughes, and do some work from the top position in the last 30 seconds, that may potentially give it to him. Yeah, because he's defended well, hasn't he? And you also wonder going forward what it might have taken out of Hughes. Yeah, back to his feet again. Hughes has been good to his promise, though, about starting fast. <laughs> He's in 30 seconds here. Seconds here. That expend of energy where he goes, huh? Trying to it. get the lift Let's and it go. wasn't quite right there yet. Yeah. He just pops right back up. He's not really lifting the legs. He's like pulling away from the fence. So he's able to just hop right back up to his feet.
The question will be this, how does he come out in the second round? Because you normally don't get tired until you sit down in your seat and you, your corner's trying to talk to you and you're exhausted. He's a Bellator 191 in December 2017. Round one, TK over, over Ash Griffiths. And uh, 16 months since, you know, it's uh, what a long time to be away from all of this activity. Switching there, Hughes. Hughes needs to take his head offline when he steps in and throws his combinations. He's leaving his chin in the air a little bit. Hands are kind of dropping a little bit as he throws those combinations. And Hughes has what he wants again. If he heads to Brian now, he's going to. The head is good off his back. He's doing, he does good work off of his back, so I want to see how he is in the open mat, though, versus just being against the fence. You could tell when he was against the fence, his whole objective was just to get back up, because he could use the fence to get up. But now that he's out here in the open mat, he's, he's, he's got some pretty good attacks from the bottom. But what I've noticed is that he just continues to always try and make one or two explosive moves to try and escape, and it's not working for him. He's got that head in our position, putting his back flat again to the ground, driving the shoulder. You see Hughes give him a little bit of a smile right there. He's certainly trying to win the psychological battle, isn't he? Kevin Hughes. I'd like to see Hughes try to drive that right knee over to try to get some sort of mount or three-quarter mount position so he can start doing more work from the top position. Trying to escape from it. The head just keeps bridging or bumping one time, but doesn't try to advance the position at all. He should have tried to hip escape out a little bit more, possibly looking for an underhook or pushing on the head to get back to his feet. He got that head in our position again, so Hughes trying to work that, that left foot in the, into the inner thigh. Um, if he can do that, then he can start trying to clear his right leg from the guard. Explosive move instead of making like two or three small ones and then one big one to explode. He's trying to take advantage of the position there. Missing with those punches. Yahaya still doing a pretty good job of defending there. That's, that maybe doesn't look like much there. What he's trying to do is he's trying to actually loosen the grip because Yahaya is holding him in that, in that position. Showing the explosiveness. Who's going to work the hooks? We're going to have to with just the one arm. I mean, in a gi, you can get it done, but right now with the, with the no-gi system, it's, it's kind of hard to finish it with just one arm. I'm not saying it can't be done. This is a nice trick that, that some of the top level grapplers will do. They'll put their hand over the fence. It's a nice little jaw lock here. He's got the hand behind the head. He's hipping into him and squeezing. This is more of a jaw lock than it is an actual choke. So close there, Hughes. Just thought for a moment your hair was Looking for a way out, but he's still in there. Minute to go in round two. Can he survive here, Mohamed Yahel? Tiring now. See the look in the eye there of Gavin Hughes. He's got that jaw lock again. But when you get tired, those jaw locks will make you tap. Again, it's, it's like with punches, it's the cumulative effect of it, isn't it? Starting to get to him. Again, he tries to lock that. 25 seconds left to try and get this finish. There it is, it's underneath the chin. Now he's got, there you go, there you go. If he can lift the squeeze, that's end tight. 18 seconds. 15 seconds to try and hang on here for your hair. Looks like he's about to
choke. In this fight game, you cannot relax for one second. So your head tries to bridge him and buck him up with one big movement, but then he stays there. Then he was able to throw it in the back, get the hooks in. When he gets to that position, he knows the, the arm goes right across the jaw. When it goes across the jaw, he seeks that other hand behind the neck. Not able to finish this one here. So now, look at your head, just relax, a little bit relaxed. He thinks he's out, doesn't get it, and he doesn't worry about the hands anymore. And then Hughes sinks in the arm underneath the chin, slides that other hand behind the head. Beautiful job of getting the finish. You can see your head trying to hold on. He knew the time was close. Wasn't able to hold on. Agonizing for him, really, in more ways than one. But it's Hughes who gets that victory. Good job by Big Tasty. You love saying that, don't I you? I do, I do. Pork chop and Big Tasty. Making well, me hungry. We've got a juggernaut coming later as well. But let's get to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the tap comes by way of a rear naked choke. Officially, four minutes, 51 seconds. Round number two, the winner by submission, Gavin. Big Tasty Hughes. Here's the tale of the tape then. Eight years, the senior Jim Wallhead. Piatrini does have that height advantage. Wallhead with the reach advantage too. Fairly evenly matched. A lot of people think this could be really good, proper MMA fight. Let's get now to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight here in Birmingham, we go to the welterweight division. Set again for three five-minute rounds. We'll introduce the blue corner first. At six foot, weighing in 170.6 pounds, his professional record, 16 wins, four losses, one draw, fighting out of Livorno, Italia, presenting the Italian bear, Giorgio Piatrini. Across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot ten, weighing in 164. Pardon me, 169.4 pounds. The veteran professional returns to the Bellator cage, bringing 30 victories, 11 defeats, fighting out of Leicestershire, England. Introducing Judo Jimmy Wallhead. In charge of the action, referee Rob Hines. So Giorgio Piatrini in the blue gloves, Jimmy Woolhead in the red, and Josh, a night when we've already had a win for Big Tasty and Pork Chop. The good news for you is that Piatrini works as a chef. So who knows what might happen? I'm hoping the after party has some food. <laughs> I mean, realistically, the question of this is going to be, can Piatrini get this fight to the ground? And if he gets to the ground, can, can Woolhead stop him from getting the submission? Can he stop the takedowns? That's first. One four of his last five. Piatrini. Last three wins all by knockout or TKO. He's come here with intent. Outside leg kick there. He's trying to slow down. Jim Woolhead. Fifth Bellator appearance for Jim Woolhead. One two, lost two so far. Both these guys have a ton of experience, so I'm expected to see a great fight from both these guys. A little bit of a filling out process right now. You know, none of them want to overcommit. That's just the inexperience. That big right hand over the top from Piatrini. Missed with it, but clearly a shot he's looking for. Combination of hooks there as well. He's mixing it up pretty well early on here, Piatrini. Concern with Jim Wallhead always has been he's mainly a boxer. Someone doesn't utilize his kicks as much as he possibly could. And he should get in a position like this. Piatrini, that's what he does. He's gonna mix it up. With the punches and the kicks. Good leg kicks to start off, but that helps set up the takedown or the takedown attempts. It was thought through, wasn't it? The opening minute and a half for Piatrini was all about trying to look for that. I see Wallhead use a little bit more of the kicks. Rather nice to the right there. Beautiful job Carter catching it. And Piatrini overbalanced there as he came forward. Big left hook right. there from Wallhead as well. Nice little overhand right again from there. Oh, 
Really lunges forward with that jab, doesn't he, Pietrini? Yeah, it's almost like he's trying to set up the elbow. So he actually lunges in, almost like he's trying to throw that elbow. Got caught with the way in there by Wallhead again. Just went for the body there as well, Pietrini. Again, trying to mix things up. Already redness on the left leg of Wallhead, that front leg. Pietrini's had some success with those kicks. I thought you were going to say there was some redness on his nose or his face. I was like, no, that's the beard. <laughs> All the way from California, he's here all week. That's the with the right hand. Yeah, and Wallhead responding. One of his own. I think Wallhead's winning the exchanges on the boxing, but Pietrini mixing up with the kicks is kind of keeping Wallhead a little uh, settled in uh, right there in front of him. is it up the Italian. Called the Italian bear because when he's on in training camp, he's a big fan of honey. The name somehow stuck. You see the years of miles on our wall head, just as far as his composure. Gets hit with a clean shot, just keeps kind of walking forward, using his head movement. Never shows that he was hurt or concern, any concerns on his face. Nice work. Blocks, covers kicks, does nice work. Nice looseness about him as well, the way he just casually blocked that kick. And Wallhead will fight at this pace the whole fight. So Piazzao Pietrini's jumping in every time. That's a lot of energy. So if you're just if you're smothering your own shots, you tend to get tired. Nice shot there. Beautiful left by Wallhead. Best punch of the fight so far from Wallhead. Again, he just uses that arm, that shoulder to block the kick. This is the pace that Wallhead's gonna fight out this whole fight. He's gonna keep trickling forward, just keep walking through your stuff. And he's just gonna keep touching you and touching you. And eventually, as the fight goes on, he's gonna start landing the big clean shots. Set up that right hand behind the left jab. Wallhead and Pietrini responded with a kick. That's another good jab as Wallhead finds his range with that punch. Pietrini answered right back with a jab, and then Wallhead answered right back with his jab. I just wonder if those outside leg kicks will reap benefits of Pietrini later on in the fight. Blood from the nose of the Italian as well. Somebody like Wahed's used to the leg kicks. All the years of training, he's used to taking those leg kicks. Really good opening round, as we expected, Josh. It was a little bit busier, but see how he's lunging in and coming in, but overhand right by Wahed, nice work. I got one leg winning the round, but also, too, I could see it potentially going the other way because of the leg kicks. The leg kicks will play dividends later on in the fight, probably in the, in the end of the second or in the beginning of the third round. The wallhead doing some good work. Snap the jab. Nice job. <laughs> you can see the support of, of Paul Daly right there. He's liking what he... Great respect between them. Well, Pietrini threw a little uh, punch at the end of the round. It was like, kind of right at the bell, right after the bell, and he just wants to let Wallhead know that he respects him, and that, hey, it was a, uh, you know, no disrespect. Oh, the timing on that takedown was absolutely beautiful. I think when he went back to his corner, his corner was to told him, hey, he's lunging in on shots. Let's time that takedown. That also makes Pietrini a little bit more hesitant to throw the kicks and lunge in for big shots. It's all part of the chase match that's developing between these two. That, that little hesitation will open up the hands a little bit more. Straight away, though, Pietrini got back to the rhythm of that kick on that front leg. Pietrini with a little trickle of blood through his nose. They're talking to each other right now, which is good. That always makes for an exciting fight when guys start talking, chatting a little bit back and forth to each other. That's when they start letting each other know that, oh, that was a good shot. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah, it feels like that kind of relationship, doesn't it? Mutual respect. <laughs> Moment, it's Wallhead is on the front foot, Pietrini. He's trying to re-establish some kind of advantage there. Well, what happened was Pietrini threw that leg kick, and Wallhead checked it, so the Pietrini went to the back leg. And the back leg's not as conditioned as the front leg. So, Wallhead take that. Nice take that by Wallhead again. Timed it again, Josh, really well. 
Pietrini keeps jumping in on his combinations. When he does that, he leaves himself open. He's a little bit in the air when he, when he steps in. Steps in real hard, jump, lunges in for the takedown. I'd like to see Wallhead pull him away from the fence so he can do some work. Or put his back, there he goes, trying to put his back flat. See how he's pushing his head towards the mat? He's got, trying to keep his left hand on his neck or his face so he can push him down and keep him flat so he can't sit up and use the fence to walk up. You see Paul Daly in the background there. No nerves yet. Wallhead's, Wallhead's doing all the work. He's maneuvered him really well. Pietrini trying to defend it here. You see the marks all over uh, Wallhead's legs from the leg kicks. Nice job by Pietrini to get back to his feet and press the Wallhead to the fence. Yeah, real physical strength there. Jim Wallhead said this week that old man can still fight. I've got a big gas tank, but he might just need it here. It's not even so much the gas tank, it's just the, the years of experience and the relaxation. You see it right here, he circled off. Circled back in, tried to put Pietrini to the fence, and just stepped in. Now he's ready to start throwing combinations. He's gonna have to start checking those kicks, though, because that leg's getting a little red. Pietrini's strength, noticeable. Wallhead again acknowledged that this week. I suppose you can't fight someone called the Italian Bear and not expect him to be strong. Great yes. defense. Jeez, what a score. Beautiful timing on that takedown, but you can see that man, look, he's limping a little bit, he switched his stance for a split second. That's a fighter's tell right there, those leg kicks are playing dividends. He tried to check that one a little bit there and it didn't get there in time. That redness is glowing like a target for Pietrini as well, and he can't miss it at the moment. That's the pro, there he goes, he's having, he's having it, see look at it, he just kind of limped a little bit, now he switched his stance. So Pietrini can't get his knees up and start working for a sweep or getting back to his feet. He's got to keep those knees pinched or maybe even figure for those legs so he can't work back up to his feet. I can't say it enough, you got to turn their backs off the fence. What I do like that he's doing right here, see how he's putting his forehead in his chin? That's exactly what he needs to do to make him uncomfortable. That also kind of helps keep the person down. If they can't stand up because you're driving your forehead down in their chin and their chest, so it's harder for them to kind of posture up. Thirty seconds remaining in round two. It's going to be a tough fight to score this one. Already feeling that way. Yeah, but I think that fourth round is going to play dividends for those leg kicks. They're going to finally start paying off. If, if, if Wallhead starts having to switch his stance or can't make adjustments with a couple more hard leg kicks, we can see another fight also. It only takes one or two straight hard leg kicks for you to not be able to stand up. He's already kind of looking for switching his stance. I give that round to Wallhead. So the first round. Scorecards suspect we might, but here's some of the action from that round two. Beautiful job on the outside leg trip takedown. He got in on deep with the double, then hooked the outside leg. He got the takedown. Nice way of snapping the jab. You go with the leg kicks. You can see right there, you can see a little bit of uh, wall hit. See how he switched his stance for a split second, and his leg went stiff. It's because he didn't want to put any weight on it. And then that back leg rear kick is what he was doing. So when Wyatt started switching his stance, he had to the back leg as well, so he can start. The place here now. After a contest like this, a third round for two very tough fighters. Jim Wallhead with those red gloves and Piatrini straight away. Looks for that soft tissue, the outside of that left leg. Nice job. He shot a dry takedown too. It wasn't even a very good takedown shot. He didn't set it up, didn't do anything, but he was able to get that takedown. Piatrini's getting a little bit tired, you can tell it, because he just there was not a, not a whole lot of defense to it for stopping the takedown. You can tell the experience of Wallhead is coming through towards the later uh, half of this fight. Pietrini's last defeat was March 2015. That's a long time. By, yeah, Marvin Vittori. I think it, I think Wallhead's corners told him, hey, you know what? We're having success with the takedown. We just got to control him a little bit better from the top position. 
Let's get this knocked out because look, we for sure won. They for sure won the second round. That first round, I gave it to Wallhead, but I could see that maybe the judges could have given it to uh, Pietrini with the uh, leg kicks. He still dreams of making an impact at the very highest level, Jim Wallhead, and all he can do is keep winning. Pro MMA debut in April 2005. Paul was telling us some of that history beforehand. One of the real forerunners. Nice job in pushing his, his body between him and uh, Pietrini so that Pietrini could use the fence to get back up. That's just experience right there. That's something you, years and years of training that Wall has been doing. I mean, that was beautiful work by him. That took away his ability, Pietrini's ability to get up and use the fence to get up. He is starting now to turn the screw, starting to really dominate. Yeah, my, my honest opinion is right now, he's just trying to control that top position, making sure that Pietrini doesn't get up, so he can win at least the first three minutes, three and a half minutes of this round, so then Pietrini can do something dramatic to win the rest of the round, and he did, is able to get back to his feet. Using those little short cuffing elbows as well there, Woolhead. Gonna do enough to maintain the position. Pietrini knows he's gotta get out of this, gotta get up. Here's what I was talking about in the first round. All that lunging in, in the first round, landing the clay kicks, jumping in with the big shots. That eventually adds up to him being stuck on bottom right now, because that ended up leading to him getting takedowns. Uh, while he getting the takedowns, a little easier takedowns, not really having to work for him, as well as him having to try to get back up. He doesn't have the energy right now that he would have had, I think, if he's not someone that just lunges in with big punches, big combinations. Starting to look like he might be spent here, Pietrini. Well, he got that far side. See how he's got the arm in throughout. He's got like the two on one on that far side. Now he's able to last shots. There's a whole new position for anyone to be in. Clean shots to the head right there by Wallhead. And now it's unrelenting here for Pietrini. If he was to open up and let some big shots go, you can see the ref looking to step in. Wallhead must have opened up a little cut on Pietrini because he's bleeding. No, the nose is bleeding. I think he's still the nose, isn't it? Yeah, it's got worse and worse. Yeah, I think he's got a little cut under that eye also. That right eye. Pietrini defending desperately as we head for the final minute. What entertainment from these two, but Jim Wallhead now. Just over 60 seconds away from surely what must be a win. Well, head doing a good job. You see just the redness on that leg. So those leg kicks from Pietrini. Great work, though. Great work by Wallhead controlling this whole round. Got the takedown early. Never gave Pietrini an opportunity to get back to his feet. And if there was any jeopardy at the start of this third round. Okay,
throughout this whole series. Kind of opened up a couple little cut areas there um, on Pietrini. Good elbows there. Made enough space, landed the good chopping elbows. Fight comes to a close. I mean, outside of a straight score guard, I don't see how he loses this fight. I had him win it for sure in the second and the third round. I even had him win in the first, but I can see him potentially losing the first on one of the score cards. Yeah, the strange and the strange. That would be remarkably strange. But a good performance still from Pietrini. Michael just uh, making his way back into the cage. We think to confirm the win for Warhead. He's going to be limping for the next couple of days. A couple of days, Damage maybe over a week. Left leg. Maybe over a week. Said by a man who's been there, I suspect. Let's get to our ring announcer. Just wait for the fighters to line up. Here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for your decision, we go to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Ben Cartlett, sees the fight 29-27. Judge Michael Bell, 30-26. And Judge Doug Crosby, 30-27. to I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Judo, Jimmy Wallhead. So here's the tail of the tape, Woody. Five wins and two defeats, lost a split decision last time. He's nine years younger than David Kalsa. Same height, obviously same weight, and the reach just in Wooding's favor here. This will be quick, we think. It will be explosive. Let's get now to the voice of Bellator, to Michael C. Williams. Set now inside the Bellator cage. We go to the featherweight division scheduled for three five-minute rounds. We introduce first the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 145.6 pounds. His professional record early on stands at two and four. He fights out of Kidderminster, England, presenting David, the Demolition Man, Kosa. And across the cage is the adversary out of the red corner at five foot nine, weighing in 145.6 as a professional. Five victories, two defeats, fighting out of London, England, introducing Dominique, the Black Panther Woody. And the referee in charge of the action, Leon Roberts. Well, David Kalsa here in the blue gloves says he has an unbreakable mentality. That will surely be tested here against Dominique Wooding. The thing with Kalsa, the thing with Kalsa, what he does sometimes, he reaches to parry the punch. That's dangerous against a southpaw like Wooding. Because what happens is he throws that straight left and he falls with a head kick right after that. Put the lights out of Kalsa. Straight left from Wooding. Good mixing up there with the outside leg kick too. The speed's already a factor for Costa. He's having a hard time figuring out the range right now because Wooding's so fast. He's trying to set up those hands though, isn't he, with the, the legs in the first place. Great hand speed. Good. You see that had an effect on Costa. He kind of dropped his elbows in a little bit. Keep his head here, Carlson. A much easier set than Dom. There's the power again of those kicks, and again from Woody. You can see the hematoma already developed on uh, Carlson's uh, ankle. On that calf. We call that low level calf kick. That's what happened with Patricky when he fought Scope. They're ready that hematoma after. And in 10 seconds, Choosing his shots, he's not rushing things and sweating things. He's sticking to his game plan. You can see that that hematoma already developing on Costa's leg, and it, it's having an effect on how he's handling things. He's having a hard time putting pressure on that. He's so afraid of being kicked in that calf right now, again, that it's opening up the availability for uh, Woody to throw the the combinations to the head. Really deliberate work this from 
Wooding. I'd like to see Wooding go back to that calf kick a little bit. He's kind of head hunting right now. He's looking for the knockout when he can actually get a finish with the knockout of the leg kick. That's a throw in left hand. Wooding trying to time it over the top with the right and then connect it with a straight left. And then mixes it up with a, an accurate kick and then a left hand. from Josh. Let's get the official announcement from Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. Two minutes, 43 seconds into round number one. The winner by TKO Dominic, the Black Panther Woody. So here's the tale of the tape then. Eight and four for Hattie's record. Four and four for Danovich, who's seven years older than the man from Birmingham. And the reach advantage is really significant for Yannick Bahati, born in the Democratic Republic of Congo, fighting and training out of Birmingham. Let's get to our ring announcer, to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for those joining us worldwide, live on the Bellator MMA Global app, we welcome you to Birmingham, England, for the second event of Bellator MMA's European Series, where the prelims roll on with three five-minute rounds in the light heavyweight division. Introducing the blue corner at six foot three, weighing in 202.4 pounds. His professional record four and four. He fights out of Atlanta, Georgia, USA. Amir the Dragon Dardovic. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot two, weighing in 203 pounds, even as a professional. Eight wins, four defeats, fighting out of Birmingham, England. Introducing Yanni Black Mamba Bahati. In charge of the action, referee Leon Roberts. So Danovich in the blue gloves, Bahati in the red. Bahati with that pro record of eight and four, but three defeats in a row. Would re-establish himself on the scene. What could Danovich do against someone who prides himself on his cardio as such a late replacement?
The one thing about Bahati is very patient. He's a patient fighter. He waits for the fight to develop in front of him. He's fast, he's explosive. But he waits for you. He's more of a counter striker, but he waits for the fight to develop in front of him. He waits for an opening and then explodes. Your timing was as good as his there, Josh. As you said, explosive. The right hand onto the chin there of Danovic. But I get back to some of the basics of just fighting. He's got to move his head a little bit offline. He's got, he's got, he's fast, he's explosive, he's all these things, he's got good wrestling. But I want to see him move his head and shrug his shoulders a little bit more to get offline. Big takedown, big lift, big takedown. It's a lot harder for these guys, for the bigger guys, to get up off the bottom because you're carrying not just your own weight you're trying to get up, you're carrying somebody who also weighs 205 pounds or, you know, by the time they fight, they're probably 215 pounds, something along the line. Good position for Yannick Bahati. He's got him here's, uh back to the to the mat. Flat again, like we talked about pretty much all night. He's just slowly, methodically working to hit that Kimura. He's gonna try to break the grip of the Kimura grip. So Amir's probably holding his shorts or hold, something along that. He's trying to make sure that he can't get his, his uh, grip broken. He's struggling there a bit is. here, Amir, I think. Isolating that arm. Body needs to use his right elbow to kind of push his uh, his knee down so he can bring his knee through. There you go, straight right to the pass. Now he's in good side control position. He's still working on that Kimura. He's got good cross body position, so he, Amir's back is flat to the ground. He wants to take that. He wants to take that left leg and step over his head so he can't make the transition. He's trying to put that hand right behind his neck. He needs to pinch his knees around his head so he can't move around. There's a little bit too much space there. He lost that Kimura grip. Good escape initially from Danovic. Going up though, he's, got, he's still in a good position. He needs to pull the arm out and then up and then away. He's, 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 Inside the Bellator cage, the official time, three minutes round number one. The tap comes by way of the Kimura, the winner by submission, Yannick Black Mambo Bahiti. Here's the tail of the tape, as Josh was saying, two veterans, 31 and 34. And look at the number of fights as well. 39 for Chadwick, 14 so far for Mulheron. Chadwick, certainly the taller man, and Mulheron with that slight reach advantage, but I know we keep saying it on this terrific card we've had so far, but there should be fireworks here. We think they will stand and they will trade. And let's get now to the voice of Bellator, to Michael C. Williams. And now, ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, we're set for three five-minute rounds in the light heavyweight division. Introducing the blue corner, at six foot, weighing in 205.8 pounds, he brings a veteran professional record with 24 wins, 14 losses, one draw. He fights out of Liverpool, England, Lee 
the Butcher Chadwin. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5 foot 10, weighing in 206 pounds even. His professional record 11 victories, 3 defeats. Fighting out of South Shields, presenting James the Juggernaut Moharan. And the referee in charge of the action, Rob Hines. Respect between them. Lee Chadwick in the blue gloves. James Mulherin, the juggernaut, in the red gloves. Mulherin's got to keep his back off the fence. He's got to let those combinations go. Don't settle down too much in front of him because Chadwick can get to the takedown right away. The last thing you want is Chadwick on top of you. Chadwick was asked what he learned in the fight against uh, Fabian Edwards, and he said, I learned I can eat head kicks like Smarties. <laughs> got a good sense of humor. He's got a good look at life. Lee Chadwick, they both had these two. Left hook there from Chadwick missed, and so did Mulherin's response. The thing about Mulherin is he throws, he's got power in his hands, but he throws combinations like punches and bunches. That nice little uppercut, uppercut there, straight jab. He just knows how to throw combinations that keep people guessing on where he's going. Just missed with that uppercut. If he connected, I think uh, he would have had Chadwick in all kinds of trouble. And this by a long way with that uppercut again, but he's looking for the shot. Yep, there was that there. That one landed. But this is not where he wanted to be. See, he wants to keep his back off the fence. Nice job at turning. Yeah, Chadwick was looking for that leg, wasn't he? The single leg. Those people that are like people tuning in and watching on the app and all these, don't let the don't let the, the body fool you. This guy's got some hands, he's got some fast hands, he's very accurate with his striking. He's fought a lot of tough, tough guys in that 11 and 3 record. A lot of tough guys. Uh, notable wins for him against Stan Economou, Neil Grove as well. Be a big win this for either man. Chadwick just trying to put some pressure onto the body there. Chadwick talked in the build up to this about his opponent's ego. He said he feels it makes him make mistakes and walk onto shots. He looks to make things happen too much. Yeah, Mohair is somebody that he tries to make the fight happen. He's somebody that's going to walk you down. He's going to try to make that. He's going to try to make this a gritty, tough fight. But out in the center of the cage is where he needs to do it, not here with his back against the fence. Good knees, though. Good little dirty boxing. He's comfortable here. I just feel like this is the next step for Chadwick to getting the takedown and potentially getting the being on top for the whole round. Oh, big left hook by Chadwick. Yeah, really good shot that was. Clean shot from Chadwick. Well, Harris look for right. that right hand again. Well, Harry doing some good work with the knees. I like what he's doing. Nice little, try a little foot sweep there. Looking for that uppercut again there, uh, Mulherin, but... Needs to get back up. Push up on that hand. Well, there's a minute and a half to go in the round, and that's what Chadwick was looking for, but Mulherin does well to use the cage to get back to his feet. Never settles down on the bottom. He always tries to get back up to his feet. Nice work. Digging the underhooks right now. Now he's going to start doing some work with the knees. The thing with the knees, though, right? You, you don't think that, it, oh, those don't look hard. But if you're breathing in at the wrong time or you're breathing out at the wrong time and they hit you clean, I mean, those little liver shots are nasty. You see boxers, they don't look like they get hit with the body shot. It looks like it didn't hit that hard, but they go down. Right left hook there from Chadwick, but it's a good right hand. 
for Mulherin. Tell you what, two yeah. serious chins out there. That was another great right from Mulherin, and Chadwick took it. Yeah, I'd like to see Mulherin make space and get away and let his hands go again. Because every time you're here, you're giving Chadwick an opportunity to do that right there. Turn you back to the fence and potentially get the takedown. He needs to stay out in that open space and let his let his hands do the clock. This might actually be a good thing for him. They'll break in, probably start him back in the center of the cage again. Yeah, he's got time to recover from the shot that was low there, Chadwick. People, have, I've had this conversation with people. They're like, "Oh, um, here you go. You see that? You see the little growing shot? It really just skimmed off the front of the, the cup, but it sometimes lifts and causes a little bit of pressure on the undercarriage there. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, we're back at it. But I've had a lot of talks and conversations with people saying, like, about Mohair and how they love watching him fight, but it's the it's it's the visual appeal. They're like, oh, he just doesn't look the part. He doesn't look like he's a fighter. But man, is he is he he's he's every true form of what a fighter is." Good opening round, tough round to score potentially that. Well, Heron and Chadwick doing or trying to do different things. Yeah, I would give, I would actually give the round to uh, Moharan only based off of the fact that he landed the cleaner shots. And uh, nice little left uh, hook there right by Chadwick. But I'd like, I, I would think that the, the bigger shots were actually landed by Moharan, so I would probably give him the round, but it was a close round either way. Nice straight right right there. He actually landed another one, I think, right after that. The other thing it's worth taking into account is it might just be one of those where it depends where the judge is positioned because a few of those Melheron shots were quite hard to judge from, from the angle about yeah, how well they landed. So that could come into it too. One of those little uppercuts ended really well as well. Happens sometimes, doesn't it, though, that depending on where the judge is seated, whether it's boxing or MMA, they can sort of see a different fight sometimes. We'll see. Two wholehearted fighters, though, both dreaming of bigger things. This always looked like a really good match. Well, Heron was looking for that uppercut as Chadwick just overbalanced a bit as he came in. Mulherin doing a good job of stopping that initial takedown. Mulherin's got to get his back off the fence again, start digging those underhooks, trying to turn Chadwick. Those knees are paying dividends too. It's making Chadwick move a little bit to where the point where he's got to not be able to keep pushing against him because he's just pushing right into the knees. Good knee right there. Again, looking for that knee, Chadwick getting his head into a good position there, trying to put the pressure on the juggernaut. Not, Chadwick doesn't want to hang out here, though. He either needs to drop down on the leg and try and get the takedown, because just pressing him to the fence is not get, not winning you the round. You've got to be doing work. Well, Heron right now is out working him. Already a minute and a half gone in round two here. Well, Harry landed some good knees. They don't seem like they're that hard, but I'm telling you right now, they start to add up. Good right hook in there as well from Mulherin. Chadwick tries to respond with a knee of his own. Now he has to take down there, Chadwick. But he pops right back up. That's a great job. Heron again it. using those knees. The optics with Malheron are so deceptive yeah. in terms of his physique, but he can seriously fight. The other thing that people underestimate, like they, they physically look at him and they think that he's not in shape. He's probably one of the most in shape fighters I've seen fight, especially here in the UK. You see him fight, he's doing such, he does such a great job and he stays busy, active. This whole time he's been active against the fence. 
Throwing knees, throwing little uh, uppercuts, throwing little hooks to the head, digging his underhooks. Good knee again. The only thing is, he needs, he needs to look like he needs to circle off the fence so it looks like he's dominating the fight. Chadwick trying to get those hands into position, was trying to look again for the legs, but good defense from O'Hara. Just feels as if Chadwick needs to do something different here. Yep. Yeah, he's just not busy enough because he's trying to control the position, and that's generally what happens when you're the one pressing someone to the fence. You're either, you're either trying to get the takedown, or, or, you're, or you're striking, making space and striking again. He, he wasn't really trying to get the takedown. Now Mohara is pushing him and turning him to the fence. Says he feels much more comfortable. A light heavyweight. Scribed uh, the weight cut for the Edwards fight. Said he was a shell of himself. It's good action there, Mohara. Mohara doing Let a good go job first. at throwing that uppercut, so that's keeping Lee Chadwick from actually shooting. So that's why he's having to press him against the fence. But I'd like to see him drop down on a single or drop down on the double to try to get the takedown. He did it earlier this round, but wasn't able to secure him and hold him down. Mohara doing a good job at lifting those double unders. There, nice job. Chadwick taking a deep breath yeah. right there in that exchange. Gulped the air in, didn't he? Yeah, he's having a hard time keeping those hands up. Big uppercut. It's a huge fate followed by the uppercut and then a knee from Mulherrin. Into the final 30 seconds of this second round. Good job this trip. James Mulherrin so far in round two. On the back foot, but still potentially doing enough. Yeah, you, you got to figure out what the judges are looking for tonight. Are they looking at the guy who's pressing forward or the one who's landing and being a little bit busier? So it really depends on the scenario of what the judges are the criteria of, this, of what the judges are looking for. I mean, honestly, I, I had Mulherrin win in the, the, the round kind of convincingly because he was a lot more busier against the fence. Chadwick had the one takedown, but Mohara bounced right back up to his feet, never secured the position. It comes down, doesn't it? Particularly in that second round, what the point you were making about Chadwick's position, pushing him backwards against the fence, is that enough? If yeah. as a judge you think it is, then he probably wins the round. If not, as you say, then no. Yeah, I don't I can't I can't imagine a judge giving Lee Chadwick the round based on the fact that even though he was pressing him against the fence, there was never any strikes or knees or anything being involved. So there was no real damage done. And when you're on the criteria of who's doing the most damage in the round, that's the number one criteria. Chadwick getting the crowd going. Almost you sense, trying to get himself going. Great respect between them. How do they have it to this point? Is it one apiece? Is Mulherin? Two rounds to the good. They can't focus on that. Mulherin again missed with that uppercut by a mile. So that's keeping Chadwick from really shooting that double leg. And he threw that straight right, right down the pipe. Oh, Chadwick landed a good right hand. Got Mulherin backing up. Does Chadwick know? Has he been told you've really got to go out? Look for the stoppage, at least win this round convincingly. His corner may think that he won the first round. So it could be 1-1 one, one going into this third round on the scorecards, or it could be 2-0 two, two uh, Moharan. Digging those punches into the body. Mohair doing a good job of getting the underhooks again. Mohair feels really relaxed here. You can tell he's there's there's no concern in this position. He's he's got a good little bit of a wide base, got the overhook on one side, underhook on the other. I hate to see him get careless though. 
and just start relaxing too much and get taken down and end up losing this round because we don't know how the first round was judged. There we are, there we are. Drop on it. Go then on the side. Body head leg. Body head leg. Body head leg. Keep it there. Back at those Keep knees. There. Looks so Keep comfortable in that position, Mulherrin. There we are. Body head leg. It's a leg. He's got to be careful about fighting in bursts, though. He needs to do enough here, here in this third round. Keep it in delay. There we are. Keep working there. Those are good shots. Those are good shots. They're landing clean. I mean, they're not anything that's going to knock you out, but those are good. Those knees, the Mohair and landing too. Those are doing real well. You see Chadwick's body lift a little bit. Drive it. Drive it. Keep that. Drive it. If Chadwick gets this takedown, I was going to say, he's got to make sure he secures it. He doesn't just get the takedown. Waste the energy on getting it and then not securing the takedown. They're taking a lot out of each other here, these two. I feel like Mohara needs to turn off the fence, create the space in the distance, and let his hands go. All this grappling with somebody like Klee Chowick, it starts wearing on the shoulders and the arms. Your arms get tired, you can't hold them up anymore. That Your punches don't come out as clean. Mohara doesn't have that issue. He just comes out, he's got smooth, straight punches. There we go, here we go. He's gotta let his hands go. Crowd warm to this as well, they wanna see them trade. Right hand there from Mulheron, just a glancing blow, really. Back we are into this uh, position against the cage. I think Mulheron needs to do the same thing. Turn him off the fence. Don't let him hold him here, because you just don't know how the judges are, rule, are, are scoring this card. Nice little uppercut. Mulheron looking over at his uh, coaching team. It's a sign of how casual he feels, or relaxed, not casual. Now he tries to make the distance. Now he maybe has a chance to use his power. This time it's Mulheron who closes the gap, gets to the uh, side of the cage. Not for long, though. They both look very tired here, Josh. Yeah. Two big guys, two two mountain of a mountain of men. They just say that. I mean, Chadwick built like a Greek god. You look at him, you're thinking to yourself, man, this guy's gonna out outdo James Mulheron. But I'm telling you, James Mulheron is very deceptive. It's very deceiving how fast his punches come out, how many combinations he throws. He's a pretty good fighter. Just knows how to get in there and do things to nullify whatever it is you're doing. He's done that very effectively so far. <laughs> They're both breathing pretty heavy. You can hear him breathing kind of heavy here. Chad, we're going to try to get this takedown and steal the round, but if he gets the takedown and Mohara's able to pop back up to his feet, it may end up looking better for Mohara than him. Final 15 seconds. This might take some working out. Final bit of action as they stand and train as we'd hope they might for much of the fight. That is in. Chadwick down. I was wondering if he's hurt as well as tired there. Caught him with the cup. He caught him with the knee to the oh, cup right. right at the end of the bell. And you've already explained to us how painful that can be. Yeah, especially when it grazes at the front. Sometimes it'll lift right up underneath. Well, uh, these will take a while to sort out. Whatever you think of it, by the way, we'll get your definitive opinion on how you'd score it. It's got split decision written all over it for yeah. me, this, Josh. More than any other fight so far. Uh, oh, so I'm hearing right now the fight's not over. Oh, the fight's not the over. The fight's not over. It's one second left or two seconds left because it was a legal blow. They're going to ring the bell. They're basically just going to touch gloves and we're going to... It's over now. Yes. It's over now. I mean, I'm slightly bemused by that, I think. <laughs> my official scorecard, my official scorecard would be, I probably would have the first round maybe going to Lee Chadwick or Mulheron, but I mean, it's a split 50-50, but then the last two rounds, I'd give to Mulheron. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three cage side judges. Your first, Michael Bell, scores the fight 29 to 28, while judges Ben Cartledge and Brian Miner both see it the same. 30 
to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Lee the Butcher Chadwin. Wow. Well, they didn't see it the way that we did, that Josh did, but Lee Chadwick gets it 30-27 on two of those scorecards as well and gets a unanimous decision. Comes from Kate Musa. Let's get to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, as we work our way to the 10 p.m. start time for the main card tonight live on Channel 5, the Bellator Birmingham prelims continue now with three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing the blue corner first at 5 foot 11, weighing in 156 pounds even. His professional record 14 wins, four defeats by way of Warsaw. He fights out of Dublin, Ireland, presenting Matayuz Juhas Piskoj. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 155.6 pounds as a professional. 11 victories, just two defeats. Fighting out of Manchester, England. Introducing Kane, the danger Musa. In charge of the action, your referee, Rob Hines. Quickly into that southpaw starts with the blue gloves against Kane, the danger Musa. Inside leg kick from Musa. Goes to stall Pish causes momentum there. He starts wanting to come out, take the center of the ring, let him or center of the cage, let him know that he wasn't going to be pushed around. You see Musa looking to the body. Beat George Emmanuel in his last fight with a body shot. Round one in his hometown of Manchester. Was not circling though, George Peace Corps. Uh, straight left hand, that's a little dangerous. Kind of want to circle away from that power. Keep that left foot on the outside of his. The strength here at the moment, and a little bit of technique. Musa looks like he's physically like a strong guy, but size wise, he's going to look like the bigger guy. The long, lanky, just someone that's going to be hard and gritty to take down, and just. You can tell just it's the range of the distance. He's able to sink down on the hips because Musa can't get up high enough. He's a little bit shorter than him. Musa just looking for those knees to the quad there and then the inside of the leg. I keep Pishkor's thinking. A little bit of encouragement there from the referee. Musa tries to explode into action. Off the fence! Musa did a good job of controlling the wrist control before he threw that elbow. Then what happened though is he threw it. Let's go! 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 Every opportunity he gets, he's trying to throw those to the body of Musa. Musa looking to just make him work. I think he saw, he probably saw a little bit of Chadwick's fight. He said, look at my push here against the fence, keep my chin against his face, make him work in this position. He's worth the round. And the eyes of the judge is obviously for now. between Pishkors and Musa. Oh, 
Sean, this is like those positions where you don't really want to hang out too long. You either want to drop down on the single, come back up, throw some knees, throw some clinch work, maybe drop back down the line. Always keep that person against the fence guessing on what you're doing. So you just hang out against the fence. You're, you're really, you're not really not winning in the judge's eyes. But I mean, maybe here you are. Yeah. Come on, stay focused. Took the words out of her mouth after what we saw in the last fight. Rasad's got good double unders. I like to see him knee the knees or throw the knees to the thighs a little bit more. Maybe to the, the liver of the body a little bit. Pull him away, maybe trip the outside leg and get the takedown. Stay a little bit busier in that position. Round one, Kane the danger, Lusa in the red gloves, and Matthias Pishkor is the pole, out of Ireland with the blue gloves. Tricky test this for both of them to solve so far as Lusa left to take down uh, Pishkor's there. Lusa did a good job of pushing his knees back behind Pishkor's arm. He was able to kind of almost break his balance and take down. Start like landing the combinations. Created just enough space to land the elbow. Nice work. The other thing too is when it gets down towards the end of the round, some fighters start to relax, like, oh, we're not gonna do anything. You gotta always be ready to fight. Little look on his face there, Musa as well. It's uh... So round two here between Matthias Pishkors in those blue gloves and Kane the Danger Musa. How would you have scored that opening round, Josh? Look, I think my scorecard's out the door. <laughs> uh, no, realistically, I, I, I would give it to Brian Musa. But I take your point, it's, uh, it's been proven tonight that it's, it's hard to be even close to being short. Musa reached to grab the clinch. B scores just threw the knee right at the gut. It's a good uh, right start to round two here for Matthias Pishkors. Musa looking for a knee of his own. Musa pushing up on the chin, keeping the distance. That keeps him from kind of pressuring him, you know, to drop down on the legs. Oh, beautiful kick. Didn't quite land with that one. That was nice by Musa also to return. A straight right hand for Pish goes as well. One of my favorite takedowns, honestly, when you catch the kick. Right knee, right knee. Musa, though, did well to get back to his feet. Get it in. Frank Shamrock, and when Frank Shamrock would tell me, hey, don't stop moving through the rounds. And when you stop moving is when you get tired. And these guys, each one of them will do something really dynamic, and then they'll stop and they'll slow down. And that gives you a second to get tired. So you start this little break right here in action. They're thinking to themselves, man, I'm tired right now. Musa trying to push the action. 
but just he smothered himself a little bit too much. Not able, not able to land the clean shot. Honestly, these guys are so evenly matched. You really can't take one. The one doesn't want to do something that may cost them. That's been thought of as a 50-50. Some space, go ahead and throw the combinations again. Instead of smothering here, give him a chance to recover. This is probably the best thing for Peace Corps to get is, to, is for Musa to be pressing him against the fence. Because for all that it looks awkward, he can oh, go 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 some recovery go against the fence. Yeah, he still yeah, looks good in the Peace Corps. Musa went to the corner. We've seen a couple 10 8s already tonight and just grappling. He got dropped. So I, I would imagine that maybe they're thinking it's a 10 8. 10 8s are so hard to come by in the MMA because there's only three rounds. Yeah, so it's not boxing. So the fact that they're giving them out for grappling and just being in top position and getting takedowns. I don't know. Are we potentially seeing maybe our first 10 7? There. He pushes up under the chin. Very nice job. So before he circles off the fence, this is a lot of energy and a lot of work for guys, for these guys to be doing. People don't understand this exchange between two guys. Look at Musa pressing against him here. When he's pressing against him, there, he's having to drive all of his body weight, all that weight's on that back leg, and he's having to push his whole body into him. That's a lot of work. Push 
Jabba Musa trying to drive back in to get the side control position. If he can put Peace Torch back to the ground, a clear is right on. There he goes. Oh, great job. It's really good awareness there. Great positioning. Punches will take their toll. They don't seem like they're hard, but we can hear them. They're right here in front of us, in front of the cage. We can hear those shots landing. Musa doing a good job of looking. He's got, he's in the full mount position. Hasn't quite dropped his knee down. He's trying to make his way to the back. Keeping his chest and his pressure over Peach Cup so he can't get back up. and if it was up for grabs in this third and final round. He's surely doing enough here. He's in a great position anyway. He's trying to pull that elbow off from underneath him so he doesn't have a chance to build a base to get up. You usually start by building your base by posting to your elbow and then going to your hand. Looks like doing a good job. He's going to drive back over and then turn, take his legs the other direction. So that leg he's got hooked right there. He needs to try to circle it back around the other way and put Peace Cross uh, back to the mat. Moose is not letting go here. See, he's trying to control that left arm there, Moose. This is what we call it. We call this a three-quarter mount. So he, even though he's not in full mount position, his right knee is close to the hip and his other leg is free. So that's like a three-quarter mount position. He can Looking do plenty. That elbow from that position. Yeah, he can do plenty of work from there, but you see how Peace Crush have to keep getting back up to his elbow. That's how you first start building your base. You turn to your side, you po post up on your elbow, then you post to your hand, you slowly methodically get up. But he can't do that. Musa here is on the back, so he'll get to the choke. He's going to start trying to shake Musa out. That's the problem, isn't it? When you transition away from that position, you can put yourself in a, a weak spot there. Musa clinging on. Musa just stayed at a steady pace this whole fight. Never once tried to outdo his opponent. He just kept fighting his game plan at his pace. And it paid off for him, I think, at the end. I think. Let's get to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go to your judges' scorecards. All three judges at cage side, Doug Crosby, Michael Bell, and Ben Cartledge all see it exactly the same. 30 to 27, all have it for the winner by unanimous decision. Kane, the danger, Musa. And let's take a look at the tail of the tape. 11 and 7 is Moore's record, but he has fought some high class opposition. 5 and 2, Bin Sonley. Three inches height advantage for the Irishman, and look at that reach advantage as well. Let's get back to our ring announcer, who also happens to be the voice of Bellator, Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight here in Birmingham, we go to the Bantamweight division, set for three five minute rounds, introducing first. Out of the blue corner at five foot five, weighing in 133.8 pounds. His professional record five wins, two losses. Fighting out of Bartili, Sweden, presenting Ben Soli Buddha. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 135.8 pounds. As a professional, he brings 11 victories, seven defeats. Fighting out of Wexford, Ireland, introducing Brian the Pike Man Moore. In charge of the action, referee Leon Roberts. So time for the penultimate fight on this. Uh, been a terrific undercard. Out of our uh, four highlighted fights as we reach the end of this evening in Birmingham. Vincent Lee in those blue gloves against Brian the Pike Man Moore. Hands fully healed. He looks really focused as well behind that jab in these early stages. 
came out to the center of the, the cage right away. Just letting him know, letting Lee know that he's not someone that's gonna let him push him around. He's not gonna let him just run around. He's gonna cut the ring, cut the cage off, and uh, and look to land the big combinations. What I like about Moore is that he just slowly and methodically just takes pace. He throws his punches and combinations as well. Twos and threes. Keep, he's trying to find his range right now against Lee. Lee fighting out of that southpaw stance with his back to the cage. Good foot movement as well from Bin Son Lee. That was a nice job of him circling out and then getting back into the center of the cage. But now he's putting himself right back where he just tried to get out of. Just starting to find that range as well here, Moore. Well, his shots got through. Moore looks, Moore looks a, like a little brother or a big brother of, uh, of James Gallagher. Just they have a, a very similar kind of look to them. Left hook there from Moore. What I like about Moore is he's keeping that right hand glued to his chin. So he can just let it go anytime he wants and he sees the opportunity to open it up. Nice little to the body, nice little body shot. That starts opening up the head shots eventually as well. Yeah, he's done really well in this opening couple of minutes. That's a good long right hand from Moore that time. Sticking that jab, that jab's starting to like set the pace a little bit. It's kind of, that, that's his range fighter. I like what he just did right there. Nice job. He faded the jab, cut the angle a little bit, and threw the straight right. Not always accurate, but accurate enough here to keep Bin Son Lee honest. It's hard to land a lot of body. It's hard to land a lot of power when you're kind of like punching and leaning back at the same time. Lee's throwing, but also kind of backing away, making sure he doesn't get countered. Good idea as well to mix it up there from Moore with the outside leg kick. Yep. Nice long straight right line. hand again. It's a really good shot, isn't it? Well, it comes out so smooth because he keeps it on his chin. It's when he opens it up. When you open it up and you start paring it out, reaching at it, people see it. They start. Your opponents start seeing it coming. He leaves it on his chin. He just rotates the body and just throws it straight right down the pipe. Beautiful work by Brian Moore. Nine of his eleven wins more have come by knockout or submission. Five of those in round one. Durable opponent though, and he'll have to go some to match that here. Because for all our praise for Moore's boxing ability, Vincent Lee has taken it pretty well. Old school. Old school foot stomps. You like that? Marco Huas. Moore's been uh, dominant here so far. Those are nice little tricks of the tread that you learn over the years. Little foot stomps, little covering the mouth with your hands, little shoulder pops to help lift the chin so you can throw a little inside uppercut or overhand hook or drive an elbow in. I mean, he's, you can tell he's training with a good team. You can tell that he's put in some good work. Nice little outside leg trip. In a good position. Lee's got the butterfly hooks, but he's working himself into full guard. The only 45 seconds of this first round remaining. He'd like to have got it to this position earlier on in the round. Very smart, almost like a seasoned veteran movie just did there right there. He let him up and then he circled around. So Lee had to stand up and he pushed his back to the fence. Nice job. Doubling up that jab now, and then throwing the right to the body. Good all-round display this from Brian the Pike Man Moore so far. Straight right, right down the pipe. We were talking about this. It's nice and clean. Just the rotation. Here's another angle of it. Boom. Straight down the pipe. He doubled it up. Then he came back with a little, like, short jab after it. 
sets up this leg kick here. He goes, boom, leg kick, comes right back, sets his feet, then throws the jab. Feeling the position, feeling the range. Nice straight right hand again to finish it up. Circled out, wasn't, didn't stay in front of him. If he was... So Brian, the Pike Man Moore, in those uh, red gloves and Vince on Lee, if you're just joining us in the blue, Moore, surely banking the opening round here. This is the penultimate fight of this undercard of Bellator Birmingham. That's what Lee needs to do, though. He needs to start going to the kicks a little bit more to help open up his striking, his, his uh, boxing. He's letting, he's letting Moore dictate the pace of everything that's going on right now. He's got nice kicks. He just needs to use them a little bit more. It's a good kick there. Talking of kicks from Moore, the outside leg kick. And then catching the kick, Josh's favorite move, or one of them at least. I like how Brian, Brian Moore is just setting up with the jab, setting up with the jab, finding his range, just picking him apart. I'd like to see a little bit more output from him, though. Throw the straight right, come back with the left hook. Go back a little bit to the body again. That'll open up the head again. Nice work. There we go. I almost feel like he was listening to me. <laughs> Ooh. Got to be, be careful. careful, yeah. There is a threat coming back, certainly. He mustn't relax. I think the job is done. That's the other benefit of just keeping that right hand glued to your chin. He doesn't have very far to go to try to block the kick or any type of loopy shot. Breathing a little heavily there, Bin Son Lee. Dug that left to the body again. Mixing it up well there, Moore. Bin Son Lee as well, and Bin Son Lee is seriously hurt as well. He's fighting, he's kind of fighting in a backward stance. He's leaning back as he's trying to throw co clean combinations. That's putting everything on his back foot. He's not able to like land and throw anything with a whole lot of power. So that makes Brian Moore not want to have to respect anything he does. Yes. Well nice Looks work. for the knee there, Moore. Halfway, Brian. Halfway. Still a long way to go in uh, this second round. This is just one of those fights where Brian's just picking him apart, picking him apart. The opening's gonna happen. This is what I like about these young, up-and-coming kids, though. The ones that get it. He's landing clean shots, he's not in a rush. The knockout and all the other submissions and everything will come. There's no reason to rush it and force it. Right now, he's in a dominant position. He hasn't taken any damage at all. Almost getting reversed there. But I like what Brian's doing here. Brian's just hitting with the little choppy shots, making Vince Only move a little bit. Able to stay with the tight position, sits him back down. We were talking earlier about how hard it is to get up, get, you know, be taken down, get back up. Brian Moore doing, Brian Moore doing good work here right now. Yeah, just telling Brian Moore to be careful with his shots there and avoid the back of the head. Nice job. He's keeping his chest over Lee so then Lee can't start to posture up and get up. Don't be inside the glove. Just wrist control. That's good. Wrist control's good. He's doing a good job of keeping the keeping the wrist control so he can't take any damage here. But as he's doing that, he should be trying to stand up as he's trying to do it. Brian's got good position, but you notice how Brian's trying to pull the glove out. Lee can start using his momentum of him trying to stand up where he can stand up with it. Yeah, it just becomes a purely defensive maneuver, yes. doesn't it? It's taking you nowhere near winning the round, winning the fight, anything like that. Final minute of uh, round two. This is not where he wants his head. He doesn't want his head, his forehead on the, on the canvas. There's no room for your head to go anywhere, and you get hit. Brian he goes down, and we talked all night about physiologically and the, yep. and the psyche of it, too, how hard it is. Just mentally, it starts wearing on you. Every time you stand back up, and he just takes you back down, and just... Brian Moore's doing a good job with the mat returns. And blood streaming from Bin Sonley's nose as well. This is where, when, when Brian Moore tries to pull his gloves out, Vince Alley needs to stand up at the same time that Brian Moore is trying to pull his gloves out, because there's no weight on him when he's trying to do that. 
approaching the final 15 seconds. They'll have some work to do in that Binson Lay corner. Nice job of getting both hooks in, breaking him down. Maybe start throwing the strikes. Got a couple seconds to try and get this finish. Yeah, looking for the choke right at the end of round two. No. So third and final round. Brian Moore, you would feel, given what happened at the end of the second, on the brink of victory here against uh, Bin Sonlik. But things, of course, can change. It's a bit over eager there as he swung in the big left hook. You see Ben Sonley is tired, he's just keep worried about keeping the defense up. He really hasn't been able to mount any offense this whole fight. Again, it's a defensive maneuver. Sprawl there from Moore put an end to that. Brian Moore is technically a, a very sound fighter. He comes from a great camp, but I'm just simply saying that he's obviously surrounded by top talented guys, but it's showing right now, like just the position that he's in right here. He's 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 got the, the body lock around there. He's Vince Ali's got the gloves, but he tried to put his hooks in, couldn't get him in, didn't try to force it, didn't try to put himself into a bad position. He just is cool riding it out right now, landing some good shots. I mean, honestly, I feel like he's he's comfortable with just getting the win the way it is. He's getting some experience, he's figuring things out in the in the in the cage right now. You know, and, and going the distance is not a big deal. I mean, I'm sure I think everyone would love to see a finish, especially himself. But in these scenarios, in these situations, when somebody is so defensive, it's hard to get the finish. You know, I, if you and I were to grapple and all you did was keep your arms inside, it would be a hard job for me to actually try to finish you. Yeah, I think it might. I don't know. It might take you six seconds rather than the, the I normal mean, two. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's say no more like four. But I mean, I think I think that. You have high expectations for yourself, I understand. <laughs> well, high expectations for this man, Brian Moore, who in a way is starting again. This is a, a good start for him. But do you understand what I'm trying to say? It, it's hard when somebody is just really holding your gloves. They're not trying to mount an offense. They're really just trying to survive. And it's really hard to, to mount an offense against them. It's hard to get, to the, get your hooks in. It, it's hard to land clean shots because they're such a defensive fighter. It is, I think, the MMA equivalent, Josh, of a, a phrase we use in football in this country a lot, parking the bus. Yeah. And this is what's uh, happening at the moment. Don't worry, I'll explain later. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I was like, what does that exactly mean? I've, I've, I've parked a couple of buses before in my life, but I don't think it means the same thing that, you, that you're saying it means. I don't think that word means what, it, what you think it means. No. <laughs> This is just meaning a win for the Pike man, for Brian Moore. Just a good dominant performance. Ooh. Yeah, they're vicious, those knees to the body, although Binson Lee has shown great spirit to head back to his feet. Well, he might pay the price for doing so. Yeah, he can't even get, he, he, he's putting so much pressure on trying to get the takedown. You can tell how strong, physically strong Brian Moore is also in comparison to, to Vince Lee. Thumping shots there. Only interested in going to ground on his terms there, Moore. Approaching the final minute of this third round. It's going to be a convincing win unless something truly remarkable happens for Brian Moore. Will he be disappointed if he doesn't manage to finish this, or do you, you think the time in the cage is good for him? I think it's such a... He's still, he's still relatively young. I mean, he's 31 years old, but he's still relatively young. Plus, there's a lot of great things coming up in Bellator for him in this weight class. So the fact, the simple fact of the matter is, him getting a little bit more experience in a, in a fight he's obviously dominating, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. 
Obviously, I think in the last 20 seconds, last 15 seconds, you should try to just go for broke. Don't do anything that's too careless, but go for it. Whether it's a flying triangle, whether it's a, a takedown, it's something along those lines, you know? Vincent Lee hanging on, looking for the elbow. And that is that. And even though we've had one or two controversial decisions, there'll be no worries about this one. He's so dominant. Question of whether any of the judges saw any of those rounds as 10-8 rounds, I suppose, given the dominance. But apart from that, there's no, uh, no jeopardy left in this. And uh, more will move on. He says ultimately he wants a rematch with AJ McKee. Might be a while away. But uh, he's ambitious and from a very ambitious fight team, of course. Vincent Lee, well, it was a defensive display, but a courageous one. And he will go back to Sweden with uh, plenty on which to work. Moore has support here. Goes and acknowledges them, and the arena is... Uh, Really starting to fill up now as we build towards the four fights of the night. We build towards Tim Wilde's big chance against Ben Primus. He's looking for Michael, who has made his way in there with the fighters and who I'm sure, once Vincent Lee has put his T-shirt on, will be ready to uh, give us the decision. And here is Michael. For the decision, we're going to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Michael Bell, scores it 30 to 26, while judges Ben Cartledge and Brian Miner both see it the same 30 25. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Brian, the Pike Man Moore. Yeah, it was very one sided. So here's the tail of the tape. As you can see, reach advantage for Aiden Lee. I talked already about those long arms. Height advantage as well. And he's five years younger than Saul Rogers. And for the final time in these preliminaries, let's get to the voice of Bellator, Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight here at Bellator Birmingham, we conclude the prelims tonight with three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing the blue corner, that six foot weighing in, 146 pounds even, his professional record seven wins, three defeats, fighting out of Birmingham, England, Aiden Lee. And his adversary out of the red corner, at five foot 10, weighing in 146 pounds as a professional, 12 victories, two defeats, fighting out of Manchester, England, Introducing Saul Rogers. And the referee in charge of the action, Rob Hines. Really tight match then between these two, Aiden Lee and those blue gloves, Saul Rogers in the red. Touch your gloves before they get underway. So obvious straight away, Josh, as we always knew, that height and reach advantage for Aiden Lee, but how well can he use it as he switches from uh, orthodox to southpaw and back again within the opening 15 seconds? Can Aiden Lee stop Saul Rogers' takedown? That's all he has to do. He has to try and stop that takedown. Now, the hands, the power and stuff may go to Rogers, but Lee just needs to be able to stick and move, not put his back to the fence. He puts his back to the fence, can make it a little bit more dangerous for him. Big right hand. Yeah, good shot, a good response from Rogers. Rogers' legs went out a little bit there. Good kick there as well from Aiden Lee. Look at that from Rogers. Nice job by Rogers, getting the lift and the elevation. You can see the strength of Rogers. You can also see the defensively as well. 
What you have to remember when you're a shorter opponent, you're trying to get a takedown on a, on a very long guy. When you lift him up, you have to lift him up above your waist. So that's hard for someone like Rogers to do because he's, he's a lot shorter than Lee. Now Rogers is getting into the position he wants to. These are the moments where Lee needs to just keep his cool. Oh, big shot by someone's doing that to him. He's got to figure out a way to get, get rid of that figure four. He needs to fall to that side that it's locked on. Rogers falling really well. So we're looking for Rogers to attack in the net. Rogers trying to swarm all over him and use that. Those little punches to try and set up that shot. What Lee's doing is he's looking at the monitor. That's what he's looking at. He's not talking to his coach or anything. He's actually looking at the big screen that's in the arena so he can see what Rogers is about to do. That's a, that's a seasoned veteran. That's a smart fighter right there. Seasoned veteran at 24. The connection again there from Rogers. He's doing a good job at defending the chokes. Took a couple hard shots earlier. Rogers trying to set it up. But see how he's kind of unlocked that figure four a little bit. It's not as tight as it was. What Lee needs to do is take that left leg behind the foot and push it open so he can unlock that leg. He's taking big shots there. He doesn't want to keep doing that. And he's trying to block them as well. Still over two minutes remaining as well in this opening round. And that's another problem for Aiden Lee. A little cut, a nick on the right hand side of that right eye. The only issue with standing up, right, is now his legs are carrying both people's weights. Sometimes, though, that's exactly what happens. They'll get you'll get your opponent to let go. And there we have that. Take down again from Rogers, and we go back to the point we were making how dispiriting that can get if you're Aiden Lee. I agree, but Aiden Lee's doing a good job here of framing it away. As soon as there's uh, some space to be made, he's going to start to hip escape out and get to an underhook and try to get to his knees. You see him already trying to wiggle into his knees. There he goes. Nice job. Right now, he's fighting the hands so that Rodgers can't get to a, a submission. Nice job of trying to come on top. Done well to get to his feet, Lee. Now he's where he wants to be. that long reach. He caught Rogers there a little bit, kind of threw him off balance. Oh, it's a good nice excellent kick. Leg kick. Excellent from Lee. Big right hand though by Rogers to come back. That low level calf kick, it pays dividends as the fight goes on. That'll also take away some of the power from uh, Rogers' takedowns and his explosiveness is getting in on the takedowns. So far, it's been as good as we thought it would be. Not just, just made Lee miss, and he's going to try and make him pay now. We head into the final 10 seconds of round one. High energy, high paced opening round. This first round really woke up this crowd. Physically in great shape. Catches the leg, lifts. Look at Lee, just. Glides up in the air, is able to land back down on his feet, boom, hits, jumps back up to his feet. Great transitions by Rogers, though. Eventually ends up getting to the back. Not even really getting the takedown, but he gets to the back. When he gets to the back, he throws the hooks in. You see Lee right here. He's not actually looking at his corners there. He's looking at the big screen that's in this arena. And he's checking to see what Rogers is doing. So if, if Rogers moves, he can actually see the, the punch or the kick coming or whatever position he's trying to set up. If the second round is any like the first, I'm going to be ecstatic. We're going to find out right now. Aiden Lee in those blue gloves against Saul Rogers. In the red. And early shot from Lee right at the start of the fight. You felt it made Rogers' leg stiffen a bit. Needs to start using that power again here. Rogers 
Will be looking for the oh. takedown. Knee from Lee was well timed and well directed. Kind of caught him with the shin a little bit more so than the knee. Rogers just waiting for his opportunity to step in and grab the leg, snatch on the single or hit to the double leg. That's what I'd like to see more of from Lee is that push kick or that kick right up to the to the gut or to the face. That keeps Rogers honest on the takedowns. See? Rogers gets the takedown. The problem with big tall guys when they start trying, when you're fighting someone who's a little bit shorter, who's a really good wrestler like Rogers, you gotta start throwing things up the middle to keep them from shooting just blindly. So Lee got head happy. He was getting head happy and he started hunting for the head. And when he stepped in, he stepped in too close and Rogers was able to slide in for the easy takedown. Keep your head high, don't let him walk high. Keep your chin over his shoulder. Lee doing a good job, making sure that that leg doesn't get back around for the figure four. That's where he was stuck in the whole first round. Here he goes, looking for that leg lock. He's working on that knee bar position, which ends up leading into some sort of hill hook or some sort of uh, basic uh, leg lock. He's doing a good job. He's looking for it again. Yes. He's got to kick his left leg so that takes Roger's head towards the mat. He's in that 50-50, that reverse hill hook is there. Oh. I'm surprised he didn't go for that position, but good job of getting back up to his feet. Walk him off the ball, walk him off his post, so walk him back. Just needs to keep standing up, not let Rogers get the hooks in. Heads open. Beautiful salt, perfect. Yeah, Rogers looking to take his legs away there and try and take him down again. Rogers got a lot of good guys that he trains with over at uh, 365 in Florida. A lot of guys at his weight, a lot of explosive, young, talented guys that are coming up as well. What I like that Rogers is doing, he's always keeping his hands locked around that body lock. So anytime Lee thinks he can stand back up, Rogers has the strength to suck in the elbows, lift and take him back down for a mat return. Two very solid coaches as well, of course, at Hard Knocks 365 in Florida in Greg Jones and Henry Hoft. Yep. Final two minutes of round two. Aiden Lee needs to, he needs to work on trying to get that right leg free so he can start getting back up to his knee, building his base. Start off at your elbow, then go to your hand and start working your way back up to your feet. But when you lock your legs in that half guard position, you're really just locking yourself down on the bottom. Who's this taking more out of this, this kind of round, do you think? It is Lee, isn't it, on the bottom? Well, you know, honestly, Rogers had a lot of the big explosive takedowns. For me, I feel like he's expending more of the injury because Lee right now is just settled in on the bottom. He's not trying to get up anymore. So that lets, that lets me know that he's, he's tired as well, but he's not putting the effort he was putting in to not, to not get to getting back up to his feet as he was in round one. Again, those punches from this position are having an effect on Lee. Good job of getting back up. It might be a little too late. Yeah, closing 30 seconds of round two. Finally, he gets loose. Roger says he's been working on his striking, and we've seen that as Lee switches back to orthodox. That's a short right hand. hand. But this is what I was talking about, throwing things up the middle. Don't headhunt. Throw the push kick up the middle. Throw the uppercut up the middle. Throw a little side kick up the middle. Something that... Feel that Rogers has done enough so far to be in front. And the main thing for Lee here, Josh, is he needs to try and keep it upright if he can. Yeah, to win this. Oh, he just hit him with a good little knee there. 
certainly shook Rogers. Can't headhunt though, this is what I was talking about. You know Rogers wants to get the takedown, he can't afford to headhunt. Rogers went for it again there and leaded really well to use his feet. I'd like to see him throw that little uppercut, I'd like to see him throw the knee up the middle. I prefer more of the push kick up to the up to the guts or up to the face because that keeps them honest on so them dipping their head trying to get low. Another good little thing is that little, there's a little like side kick to the thigh. You can do that as well, or that little push kick or tip kick to the front thigh, that lead leg of Rogers. That'll also keep him from penetrating through to get to the takedown. And I tell you, both guys are looking phenomenal, though. They both look like they're in good tip top shape. Beautiful takedown. Lee, who gets the takedown? Timed I mean, that beautifully, didn't he? He timed it beautifully, but the only concern with that, right? I mean, it's good that he's on top, but you're down two rounds to none. You need to get a finish, you need to do some work. If Rogers can just hang out here for the whole round, he pretty much has won the fight. So Aiden Lee's gonna focus on passing guard, or finishing, or doing some serious damage to get a 10-8 round. Now he's decided against it. Rogers wants to stay on the floor. There's the axe kick from Aiden Lee. He's got, he's got to be careful. He's got to be careful that Rogers doesn't sit up on the single leg and get the takedown from there. Nice shot. He's got to get a little bit busier if he wants to win this fight. Can't get a clean shot away. It's good defense from Rogers. It's, it's really hard to sweep a guy that's that long. Here you go. Rogers with the body lock. Able to turn the corner. Now it's Rogers. He tried that little four control. Yeah, he tried a little forward roll, like a little Grammy roll to try and escape and get away. Rogers is keen to it and just follow through. Aiden Lee needs to get to his knees right here. Dig that left underhook, get to his knees, come up on a single, or just try to break away and make space. Final two minutes now of this third and final round. I mean, realistically, if Rogers was smart, he would just try to basically hold this top position, maybe do a couple little pot shots, maybe work for that submission. He's working on that dorse right now. The angle's not quite there, but I think a man of the, with his strength shouldn't have a hard time just putting that arm in that position. Yeah, the thumb up there from Lee. Referee was asking. Smart move by Rogers, though, of not trying to force it to the point where he blows up his arms, and then Aiden Lee's able to get back up to his feet and land some good, clean shots. Hand back, hand, hand, hand back, back step. Try the hands, try the hands. Rogers doing a really good job of keeping his hips pressed in, so Lee doesn't have a chance to do anything. Nice takes job. takes him down again. Having created the position in the fight, he's defending it well now, Rogers. The, the, the whole key to Rogers' takedowns is he never lets go of that body lock. Every time he has that body lock, he just keeps that body lock position. You're seeing that athleticism right there where Eddie Lee just stood all the way up and Rogers just kind of piggybacked him. This is one of the most underutilized positions, I think, when, when guys are have guys pressed with a body lock against the fence. They don't kick the feet enough. They don't try to foot sweep or try to break their balance. Never, never really, or always try to make them guess of what you're gonna do next. If you start kicking the feet and putting your knees behind their knees, you're always constantly breaking their balance, so it never gives them an opportunity to fight the hands enough or well enough to escape. He's doing a good job trying to hit that Peruvian necktie on that arm and guillotine. Final few seconds now. Are we gonna have a dramatic finish here? Nice Terrific fight, high class, but Rogers surely gonna end up on top. Hands down, great, great performance. For both fighters, great performance.
Yeah, they'll get a great ovation. Technically, by far the best fight we've seen tonight on a technical standpoint. We see some good stuff from Brian Moore. We saw some good stuff from some of the other guys. But the technique, Aiden Lee looked absolutely phenomenal. He just could not stop the takedown of Rogers. So we just wait for the uh, decision here. Aiden Lee knows, though, but he'll come again, I'm sure, as he comes out with great credit as well. One of those where it feels like just a question of by how much time for us to get the verdict from Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance in tonight's final prelim, we go to your judges' scorecards. All three judges at Cade side, Michael Bell, Ben Cartledge, and Doug Crosby all see it the same 30 to 27 for the winner by unanimous decision, Saul Rogers. So here is the tail of the tape, and you have picked out, of course, the respective ages of the fighters. Yeah, I feel like age is always gonna play a factor, you know, but like I was saying, that you cannot underestimate his age only because the fact that he looks so young, he carries himself, he takes care of his body, and you can see by the way he looks and the way he moves around the cage, you're gonna, you're gonna see tonight that he is not that age number. The age is nothing but a number to him, and he's going to show you guys tonight. Well, you're going to see him fly tonight, that is for sure. Let's get, first of all, though, to the voice of Bellator himself, Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Bellator MMA's European Series tonight, live on Channel 5. Bellator, Birmingham begins with three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner at six foot one, weighing in 170.4 pounds. Tonight, making his professional debut based out of London, England. He hails and fights out of Armada, Portugal, presenting Wilker, the Black Panther Barros. And across the cage, his adversary, fighting out of the red corner, at six foot two, weighing in 170.8 pounds, the reigning Bellator kickboxing welterweight world champion. Tonight makes his return to MMA with a record of 0-1. He hails out of Orange, California, USA, introducing the human highlight reel, Raymond, the real deal, Daniel. And when Bell wins the referee in charge of the action, Rob Hines. Time for a couple of final instructions. Time, though, for these two to go head to head. We know what Raymond Daniels is going to do. It's a question of how Wilker Barros responds on his professional debut. And we're underway. What a night in Birmingham, and what a sight this is going to be. Raymond Daniels. Loose out of that southpaw stance, already looking to spin. We talked about the age, but the thing I can tell you right now, Raymond Daniels doesn't get tired. He'll be flashy the whole 15 minutes. He does it in his 12-round fights for his world title. He's done it all around. But see how? This is what happens. Guys, they don't, they don't let the fight develop in front of them. They start letting Raymond do what he's doing, then it frustrates them and they run in, and that's how they get caught. You see a little bit of that style like with MVP. Guys get frustrated, they just start running in with their head down or their head, you know, with their chin in the air, and next thing you know, they're getting dropped and getting finished. Has to make sure that he fights his kind of fight, that is for sure, Varos. And look at the lightning speed already of Daniels. I would have thought Barrios would have thrown a little bit more leg kicks. Those little low-level calf kicks, those leg kicks to kind of slow Raymond Daniels down. 
Daniels trying to find his range. That happened so fast, I, I blinked and it was two <laughs> kicks went by. And the other great thing is to just feel and live the crowd reaction here as well, because it's a thrilling sight when it's right in front of you. I hope it's coming across on your television as well. First of those spinning kicks with which he's landed, Raymond Daniels. You'll see guys when when someone's extremely fast and you'll see the, their opponent not know how to deal with it, they basically just cover up and stand in one spot. And that, that, that makes it even worse. You've got to see it right away. He's trying to get to the clinch. I think this is where he feels like he's going to have some success now that he's caught Raymond Daniels. The question is, are we going to see a takedown from Barros? Surely that's where he'd be safest. He'd feel that anyway. Good knees, though. Those are some good work. This is where Barros wants the fight. And any kind of separation between them is where he doesn't want it. Daniels did a really good job of putting his hands on the armpits, or on the armpits, but on the biceps, making sure that he wasn't able to control that position. That Barros wasn't able to control the, the underhooks or anything along those lines that would cause more damage in the clinch. Raymond's got to be careful when he's when he's backing out of that clinch area. He's got to be careful backing out with his hands down. One of the biggest problems that guys have that come from boxing or they come from like a, a kickboxing background is they think that they're wearing 12 ounce gloves or that they're, they're wearing 10 and 12 ounce gloves, but they're not. You have four ounce gloves here inside this Bellator cage. Daniels has done what we would have expected. But yet to connect with one of those big spinning kicks. Missed there by some distance as well. He still searches for that range. Barros sees this as a massive opportunity. He had a really tough upbringing. Talks are living in Portugal in a block of flats. It was inhabited by drug dealers and trying to make the most of every single opportunity he and his family have had. And that's how he sees tonight. It's nice to, it's nice to, I see it and I hear about it all the time, but it's nice to, to know that someone's taking their life from one area and take it to the next level to get, to live their dreams. He's, he's here right now fighting on the biggest stage probably of his life and a career. Nice spinning body kick. Well, oh. attending to Wilka Barros. Nasty. Dr. That was straight over there. And just looking, he is moving. And very, very slowly being helped back to his feet. He set it up with the spinning kick, and then it was a huge right hand. So he threw the spinning. He threw the spinning back kick, and what he did on the rotation is he actually spun the opposite direction. And he spun two times around, landed, waited for him to release his guard, and then threw the overhand right. Beautiful job. Take a look at it again here. Set it up, and then opened up the right hand. What a shot. As if we didn't know already, he is the real deal. This could be an exciting, late-blooming career in the Bellator cage as an MMA fighter for Raymond Daniels. Thankfully, Barros is fine. He's just gone and...
bowed and shaken the hand of Daniels. Watch it again, though, the spin, the adjustment, another spin, and then that devastating blow. Now, Josh is doing his best. Go and have a word with uh, Raymond Daniels, which we will get in just a moment. I bet he's cool and unassuming about it. Let's uh, wait and see. And that goes down, of course, his first MMA win, having lost 11 years ago in his previous fight in this discipline. We're going to have to wait for the official announcement, of course. Barros with a smile on his face, which I'm delighted to see. Josh is standing by, but with the official announcement, as the fighters uh, embrace for a final time, we can get to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end suddenly. Four minutes, 36 seconds into round number one. The winner by knockout, the human highlight reel, Raymond, the real deal, Daniels. So Ray Daniels takes the applause of the crowd and our intrepid Josh Thompson is there with him. We can hear now from the winner. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with your winner. Raymond, what a performance. I want you to tell us why they call you the human highlight reel. Tell us why. Uh, first and foremost, Josh, I'm a, it's, it's a pleasure. You look great, brother. You clean up really nicely. First and foremost, I like to give a blur to God, because through him, all things are possible. That's why I have these abilities. It's because I was blessed with him. But uh, they call me the human highlight reel because I was blessed with a skill set. and. Uh, I, I, I challenge myself to go out and to be the best version of myself, and that's why you see me here today, stepping into the MMA world. So, so you're the Bellator kickboxing world champion. Are we going to see you now more fight in MMA? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, people like to call themselves a champ champ because they have two uh, different weight classes. I want to be the champ champ. I'll hold it down in the kickboxing ring. And I'm coming for everyone at the top of the Bellator MMA world. Let me get my feet wet. I know I'm going to have a lot of people trying to call me out, this and that. That's all right. I'm just getting started. Don't worry. Do us a favor. I want you to walk us through uh, the replay here, if you can. See if we can get this queued up. Yeah, I know, right? That's all right. I don't mind standing up here with you, but you're making me look good. <laughs> but I saw you throw a spinning back kick here. Then you actually rotated the opposite direction. Spun around, no kick, then came over with the overhand right. Yeah, I knocked him down with the spin back kick. I know I hit him in the body and it kind of hurt him a little bit. I didn't want to, you know, get too excited, overly excited and go and try and ground and pound or anything like that. And then uh, I knew he was back against the, uh, the cage. He had did a good job of trying to back away from my kicks, but because he was against the cage, I knew he couldn't back up anymore. Uh, when I threw the 720, I was going to actually throw the kick, but he pushed against the cage and it gave him more space. So then I decided not to kick and come down with the right hand. And that happened all in that split second in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with your winner, Raymond Daniels. There's already a real feel around this fight between these two, real tension in the cage. This is the tail of the tape, and you wanted to look at that height. The reason why I say the height is because sometimes Campos will literally bite down on his mouthpiece, put his head down, and just start throwing. And the fact that Carvalho is a little bit taller, it makes it a lot easier to drive those knees up the middle and land a nice shot with the knee. Well, we're soon going to find out just how this particular story will unfold. And to start us off, let's get to the voice of Bellator, Michael C. Williams. Live on Channel 5, Bellator Birmingham now presents lightweights inside the cage scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Introducing first, the blue corner at 5'11", weighing in 155.2 pounds. His professional record, nine wins, three losses. Originally from Portugal, he fights out of Dublin, Ireland, Pedro Cavalho. And across the cage, his adversary tonight fights out of the red corner at five foot nine, weighing in 155.8 pounds. The Bellator veteran tonight brings 19 professional victories, eight defeats, fighting out of Lubbock, Texas, USA. Introducing Derek Stallion. 
Campos. In charge of the action, referee Leon Roberts. So the fights come thick and fast. Pedro Carvalho in the blue gloves, Derek Campos. Legend of Bellator in the red gloves. Thought he won his previous fight against Sam Cecilia. Felt he was maybe too hesitant in round one. Suspect he won't be here already, swinging that big right hand and missing by some distance. The only thing that changes, though, in this fight, right? Because Campos was supposed to fight Ryan Scope. And Ryan Scope is someone that will stand in front of you, use the technique to basically, like, pick angles and, stri and strike with you. Carvalho will not, he'll do both things. He'll try and stand with you, but then he'll also try to capitalize on a takedown. He's really good off of his back, and he's really good on top. Oh, Carvalho is trying to box behind that jab, and then Campos speared in a jab of his own, and again. Nice body kick mark by Carvalho. Those hurt him right there. Yeah, two really good body kicks followed up with a combination. You saw Campos drop his elbows, and you you saw him kind of like wilt back a little bit like you knew those body shots landed clean. Campos thinking about getting into position for a choke there. It's been an opening that's been full of energy and drama. Carvalho doing a good job of making sure that the hands don't get up around his neck. He's fighting the feet. He's keeping his chin tucked. He's doing a nice job, nice work here. Yeah, really good defense that, isn't it? Looking to spin and get in face. Campos on bottom. Good awareness there of just where he was and what he was trying to do from Carvalho. Good knee as well. And then a left hook comes in. They both have come to fight all right. Just the kind of win that you spoke about. He now belongs at a different level. You just heard what he said. He said, I'm the future. I'm the future of this organization. Hey, with a performance like that, we cannot deny that. We can't deny the fact that he may be the future. But let's be real. Those body kicks is what set everything up, and it started off with the two consecutive ones early in the round, and then when he came back and landed the clean one there, Campos kind of wilted back a little bit, and he jumped out of the top position in the mouth. Beautiful job, though. Nice work. Well, it's an exciting time for him. He's going to be going back to Portugal after this for his mother's birthday. That's going to be some celebration now. And uh, his wife and son are going to move to Dublin, Carla and Benjamin, and... Uh, well, what a future for him, as he's just said. This was the finish, Josh. Yeah, that was a nice little body kick. And look, even though it, even though it grazed the elbow, it still lands and pushes into the uh, into the into the, the liver. And right there, that got one. That one came up right up underneath the liver, or right up underneath the elbow, and caught the liver. And you could just see he just wilted back and sat to his butt. And then Carvalho was able to get in there and jump in for the mount and the finish. Here it is again. You'll see. Nice little left hook to set it up with the right hand, and then they make space right there. Slides it in right up underneath the elbow. The couple little follow-up shots. Was able to drop him, jumped on top to the mount position. Nicely done. Impressive as well how he found his range with those body kicks right from the start, and look what it means to him as well. Potential new star, it shows you you can never be sure what's going to happen on one of these nights in the cage. They're ready for making it official. So let's get back to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially. Two minutes, three seconds into round number one. The winner by knockout, Pedro Carvalho.
Well, he had plenty to say to Josh when he was shouting out of the cage. He's got a word for Campos, and now Josh can talk to him. Sensibly. American winner, ladies and gentlemen. Talk us through a little bit of, you came over to me and started yelling at me at the cage. You said you're the future. What do you mean? I mean, again and again and again. I'm only 23 years old. I'm fighting prospects. I'm fighting, I just fought one of the best in the world, you know. And tell me, from all the so-called prospects, how many of them are facing the high-level opponents that I am? With this being said, I want my spot in the six mean man tournament. I deserve it. When I was 13 years old, I gave up to be a normal kid, to be the best in the world. It's been 11 years so far. I've been worth my ass to this moment. I deserve it. I absolutely deserve it. I just wanted to do two quick message. One, for all the Irish people that supported me, received me, and treat me like one of their own. From the bottom of my heart, I love you all. And I just want to do another quick one to all the Portuguese here tonight and see us tonight. All right, you're gonna walk us through. Just, just a... Durante anos, nós vimos os outros. E eles é que conseguiam, eles é que podem. Isso agora mudou. E eles agora vão se ajoelhar para onde nós. E eles agora é que vão já para nós. Por isso, levantem-se, gritem bem alto, porque agora esta merda é toda nossa. Obviously the crowd supports you. I want you to do me a favor. Take a look at the screen here and walk us through your replay. So, when I, when I land, before this one, when I land the first beetle shot, the Derek then took me down. I heard him, I heard him, and I knew once I put my, once we be again on the feet, I will hurt him again, and that's it. That's the job, me, David Jones, Graham, Sergey, my main coach, John Kavanaugh. These are all a puzzle that we all put together, and this is the work. One round job with one of the best in the world. All right, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for your window, Pedro Cavallo! So the tail of the tape looks like this. And look right down at the bottom there, Josh. That, not surprisingly, is what you've highlighted. Yes, the reach and the range is what I highlighted, but it's not, it's not just that, it's the athleticism of Fabian Edwards to use that reach and that range. Okay, He can keep it uh, netto at the end. At distance with the movement and the reach and the range. Well, we're going to see how this one develops. It's going to be fascinating to see what Fabian Edwards could do. Let's get to our MC, Michael C. Williams. Bellator Birmingham now presents tonight's co main event three five minute rounds in the middleweight division. And now, live on Channel 5, we introduce the Blue Corner. At 5 foot 10, weighing in 183.8 pounds in his Bellator debut, he brings 11 professional victories, 9 losses, fighting out of Villanova de Gaia, Portugal, presenting Falco MC Neto. Across the cage is adversary. Tonight fights out of the red corner at six foot one, weighing in 185.8 pounds. Perfect inside the Bellator cage overall. He stands undefeated. Six victories, no defeats. Fighting out of Birmingham, England. Introducing Fabian the Assassin Edwards. In charge of the action, your referee, Leon Roberts. Gentlemen, you both know the rules, you both know what I expect. Protect yourself at all times, follow my instructions at all times. When I say stop, you stop. Fight hard, fight fair, fight clean. If you want to touch gloves, do so now. Back to your corners. Well, they weren't touching gloves. After what happened at the weigh-in where it got Tasty and feisty and lively. Who's going to keep their cool here? Nine of Falco Neto's 11 wins have come. Nine knockout or submission, seven in round one, but Edwards has got 
the job done early as well on all bar two occasions in round one and he's got this lovely long-limbed language style David's got to be careful not to try to do try to do too much so early in the fight while Neto is still fresh obviously possesses a lot of power physically is strong let the fight develop in front of him his skills are enough to beat Neto he's just got to make sure that he uses all of them Neto looking for that single leg good wrestling skills this guy Excellent jiu-jitsu, of course. Maybe doing a good job of lifting up on the, the underhook. Trying to wizard down on him. Making himself heavy so Neto can't get the takedown. He gains his feet there and look for the knee and then look for the left hand, Edwards. Through that little inside chopping elbow that just missed. As Josh pointed out, you can clearly see it from his physique. Falco Neto is a strong man. And this is the kind of position that he wants to be in. I don't think Fabian Edwards is a weak man, though. <laughs> nice assist to the Kimura. You try to roll him through. This may put him in a position where he can end up on bottom. Not the position you really want to be with, with Neto. Yeah, strong man, and he's on top now. He's got a really good position. See those what, elbows to the body. What happened there was he went for the roll through. He put the foot between the legs and tried to roll through the Kimura, and the cage got in the way, and he wasn't able to scramble or finish the, the technique. See how Neto is trying to take as much advantage of this as he can. With the elbows, he was using the knee as well as Edwards tries to escape. He tried attacking that armbar from that position. Fabian doing some good stuff. There we go. Back up to the feet. Exactly where Edwards wants to be, and he launches that kick to the head. And then the knee from Edwards. This is what they came to see. I'd like to see Fabian Edwards cause, cut a couple angles, cut a little bit more corners. Don't let it, don't stand directly in front of it because I think feel like that's how Neto's able to close the distance real easily and get to the takedown, or at least to the clinch. There's that power from Neto again. Edwards defending the attempted elbow there from Falco Neto. Fabian's looking to try and get that underhook on the right side. He's using that knee to kind of keep the distance a little bit so maybe he can push him back, try to get back to his feet. That knee is like a little bit of a knee shield. So Neto can't pass. Oh, no, watch those up kicks. Oh, that is sensational for me. Just when I was thinking that he was on his back and it's not a position you want to be with Neto. Beautiful up kick. What I didn't understand was Neto came back in. After he stepped in, he stepped right back into another one. I think the phrase is never knew what hit him. Yeah, but all the controversy that we had at the weigh-ins with the pushing and grabbing, it's great to see the two of them talking with each other. He owns it, doesn't he? Fabian Edwards. This is his theatre. These are his people. And here, Josh, for those who missed it, here it is again. Baby with the up kick, but then he steps right back in and gets two, two more after the first one, and the shot's finished. I would have thought 
after the first up kick, he would have stepped back and maybe tried to kick the legs, get his head back underneath him. Get his legs underneath him, get his wit back about him. Beautiful, that one wasn't as hard, maybe boom. But there, back away. Nice job. Then Fabian quickly up to his feet, right with the combinations, didn't rush it. Pick and choose his shots. Straight left, little right, nice work. Set more tests, and he found answers to them. And Neto is fine, but still just coming to his senses, I think. He's a tough guy. But he does go to 7-0, as everyone expected Edwards, but I don't think too many people would have predicted him to do it like that. Bellator know they've got a real star in this guy. And as they continue to try and build him, he continues to respond. Now we can head to the cage to Michael and just make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, it comes to an end officially. Three minutes, 51 seconds into round number one. The winner by TK Hall, Birmingham's Larry Horn, Fabian, the assassin, Edwards. So Fabian Edwards, another handshake. The bad blood behind them. Terrific to see, and Josh is with him now. Ladies and gentlemen, here with your winner, Fabian Edwards. What does it feel like to fight and win like that here in your hometown? Oh, uh, it's something else. What's up, Birmingham? What's up? Let's go. Let's go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk us through the replays real quick. You had a beautiful up kick after you landed that first up kick, though. What was going through your mind when he stepped back in for the second and the third? I landed the first up kick. It didn't move. I thought, oh, fuck it. You can have two more. <laughs> fuck it. Then you got back up to your feet. He still wasn't down. You landed the clean shots. What was going through your mind when he wasn't down after the three up kicks? I was thinking the ref needs to step in. The ref needs to step in. <laughs> All right, with a women performance like that tonight, what's next for you? What, who do you have on your mind? I want everyone. 185, 205, 285. I don't give up. <laughs> I swear. But I want everyone. I don't care. Belly tour. I'm here. I'm here for that title. I'll be watching that fight next weekend. Not next weekend, in June, sorry. I'll be watching that fight. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner tonight, Fabian Edwards. Congratulations. So here's the tail of the tape, and you want to look at absolutely everything here, Josh. Uh, between yeah. Pre Primus and Wilde. They're virtually identical, as, as Goldie would say, Mike Goldberg would say, it's like they're virtually identical. 34, 31, it's pretty close. Eight and one, 12 and three. I mean, but the one loss for Brett Primus just recently happened. He's, he had an O there before. That's really the only difference. Coming off of a loss, how is that gonna affect him coming into this fight? Well, we're gonna find out very shortly. Fascinating insight and backstory there from Josh. Let's get now to the voice of Bellator. It is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, live on Channel 5, the time has come for the Bellator Birmingham main event of the evening. Three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Sanctioned by the Mohegan Tribe Department of Athletic Regulation Chairman is James Gessner. Chief of the Mohegan Tribe, Lynn Malerba, at cage side, supervising tonight, Mr. Mike Mazzulli. And now, first introducing the Blue Corner. At 5 foot 11, weighing in 155.4 pounds, making his Bellator debut tonight. He enters with 12 professional victories, three losses from Wolverhampton. He fights out of Kevin England, presenting Tim the Experiment Wild. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner. At 5'10", weighing in 154.2 pounds, the former Bellator lightweight world champion returns with eight professional victories, just one defeat. By way of Irvine and Portland, he fights out of Eugene, Oregon, USA, introducing Brad Primus. 
And when the bell rings, the referee in charge of the action, Rob Hines. All right, gentlemen, there's a Bellator main event. We've been over the unified rules in the back. Tim, do you have any questions? Brent, any questions here? Touch gloves if you wish. Back up, we'll get it going. Well, does destiny beckon for Tim Wilde here? Or will it be Primus, as pretty much every expert expects? A route right to the top for one of these men. A route back to it for the American here. Primus in the red gloves, Tim Wilde in the blue. What Tim Wilde and Ryan Scope are doing, they're leading the way for all the UK fighters to set their tempo and say, hey, we're here. You guys need to be aware of us. You guys need to understand how good we really are. And these guys are the ones laying the groundwork. These two first guys, Ryan Scope and now Tim Wilde. Already saw two of those outside leg kicks there from Primus. Wilde is rangy. Hit to the body from Primus, but Wilde catching him and Wilde on top and trying to grab some form of control, but Primus reacting well. Primus has got a very good type rubber guard position, so what he's doing here is he's working for that Oma Plata, potentially the Gogo Plata, which he's got here. He's trying to get that. There you go. He's trying to throw that right leg up over the shoulder. He's Look pulling at this from Primus. He's pulling down on that head, which is choking. That, that foot is right up underneath the chin of Tim Wilde. There it is. Wilde submits Primus just too good on the floor. Way too good. And Tim Wilde looks up into the arena and sees that chance for the time being at least fly away from it. Big smile on the face of Primus, sleep or no sleep. He saw the opportunity and he took it. Yeah, I mean, someone at his level, really, when he hits his back, and he spent a good portion of his fight with Michael Chandler on his back, and that was the lesson he learned. Go for the submission. If I don't get it, kick him back, get back to my feet, and try to get to a dominant top position. But, I mean, you hear him exchanging words, talking confidence to each other. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that that Brett Primus was coming in and, and having to work through throughout this week, just not getting any sleep. But he gets dropped here, more of an off-balance drop, not really hurt or rocked. But Tim Wilde able to get to the top position. The one thing you cannot do with Brent Primus is let him set in on that rubber guard position. From here, he should have tried to, he should have tried to like push, make space away, maybe bring his arm or, or limp arm his, let his arm out of there from that position. Because once he was here, he was setting that choke in. Normally, you got to throw that right leg up and over the shoulder to kind of pull him down even more. But he wasn't able to escape from that position once it was set in. There's the tap. And it's such a huge, huge bubble bursting inside the arena. And also, for the time being, for Tim Wilde, who can come again. But Primus shows his quality. And it was ruthless from him. And we can now make it official with Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, with the Gogo Plata in tight, the tap comes finally, one minute, 20 seconds, in your round number one, the winner by submission, Brent Primus. Well, Josh has made his way into the cage, and now we can hear from the man from Oregon, Brent Primus. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with your winner, Brent Primus. Brett, we talked earlier during the fighter week, and we were talking and having a conversation. You were telling me about how you basically didn't get any sleep. Were you able to get any sleep this last day and a half, and how did it affect you this week? Last night was the only night I could sleep, and uh, thank God, you know, it's been horrible. This time change has really messed with me, but uh, last night I got some melatonin in me, and I fell asleep for like six hours, and it, was, it felt amazing. <laughs> so Tim brought a lot of a lot of controversy, as far, not controversy, but some problems towards you. Good footwork, good hand speed, that type of stuff. How did you guys deal with it in training camp? Man, I, I trained with Timo Yama and Coach Fa, uh, Fabiano Scherner, and uh, man, I got the best coaches, the best training partners. Uh, they prepared me well, and I felt great. I knew no matter what, I was gonna, on the feet and the ground, I felt uh, comfortable for sure. 
So you, th you threw a body kick, and when you threw the body kick, he was able to actually knock you off balance. Looked like he caught you just a little bit. I could tell nothing that really hurt you. But what I wanted to talk about was that basically just walk us through this takedown. You threw that kick, and he sets you back on your butt. You sit in, you sit in on the single leg. When you go, you basically pull guard. When you get to the rubber guard position, though, you'll see you pull your guard, get to that rubber guard position. I see you work in that rubber guard. Walk us through it. Yeah, man, I, I knew I was way, way better than on the ground. My, my jiu-jitsu is awesome. Uh, that's my move right there. You know, I tap everybody out in the gym. Uh, the Uma Pilata get the sweep on top and put him away. But, man, I got the go-go Pilata on him. And uh, I knew once we went to the ground, he's in my world. First of all, I got to say thank you, Jesus, for this wonderful life you've given me. Thank you for my family, my friends. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Jesus. So now, after that performance tonight, the first round finish, knowing, knowing that you fought Michael Chandler last, you lost your title to him, who are you looking to fight besides Michael Chandler? Is there somebody else that we know? Um, I want Michael Chandler. You know, uh, I beat him the first time, he beat me the second time. Let's get this over with, a trilogy, let's, uh, let's end this crap. Um, I do not like that guy, and I did not fight my best to performance my last fight with him, and I know I could have done way, way better. And honestly, he got really lucky I didn't choke him out in the second round. I should have switched to a gable choke, I should have put my body, cho uh, body triangle on him. But uh, I want Chandler. But if I don't get Chandler, obviously I want one of the best guys. Uh, no, Petricky, Benton Henderson. Um, but I really want uh, Chandler. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner, Brent Primus. Yeah, Brent Primus getting it done nice and early. Just one.